Hey team, uh, I'm going to read a piece from Julius Jacobson, uh, and I'm going to read the first little bit about uh, uh, I'm going to read a little, the wiki, little Wikipedia page about Julius Jacobson uh, before I read the essay. Okay, so Julius Jacobson, 1922 to March 8, 2003, was an American socialist writer and editor who edited Anvil, New International, and New Politics all publications in the third camp tradition of socialism, a democratic Marxist tradition sometimes called Schachtmanite, after its significant theorist, Max Schachtman. Biography. Jacobson came from an Eastern, East European Jewish immigrant family in New York City. The family was politically leftist, and he was politically active at a very young age, mm -hmm. first joining the Communist Party's Young Communist League, but soon leaving the group for the Young People's Socialist League of the Socialist Party of America, where he became a Trotskyist and met his wife, Phyllis Jacobson. Drafted into military service during World War II, Jacobson saw combat in Europe and participated in the liberation of Paris. While in Europe, he participated in contact between European and American Trotskyists. An early ally of Max Schachtman and Hal Draper, he followed them out of the Socialist Workers' Party and, then, and with them was one of the founding members of the Workers' Party, later known as the Independent Socialist League. Um, for those cure interest in left communism, I believe uh, in uh, one of Lauren Goldner's like autobiography uh, pieces, where he's either talk he's talking about being a leftist in the '60s, and I believe he started out. In I think he was a Berkeley student in the late '60s, and his uh, but he was a member of that uh he was a member of the uh independent socialist league um, i think that's where he cut his uh political teeth but i'm not sure about his biography i don't know lauren goldner sorry i'm putting on a sweater i'm outside and it's uh december 4th here in the mid-atlantic and uh yeah, so I had to put put one on. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Founding member of the Workers' Party, later known as the Independent Socialist League, eventually becoming editor of its journal, New International. Like Hal Draper, Jacobson was opposed to the merger of the Independent Socialist League into the Socialist Party of America and to Schachtman's drift towards the right politically. Unlike Draper, he did not turn his energies toward creating a new socialist group, but rather into the creation of an independent journal, New Politics, in 1961, together with Phyllis Jacobson. He remained active as a writer and editor of New Politics up until his death in 2003. In addition to his work published in Anvil, New International, and New Politics, Jacobson contributed to the following books, The American Communist Party, A Critical History, 1919 to 1957, with Irving Howe and Louis Koser, The Negro and the American Labor Movement in 1968, Soviet Communism and the Socialist Vision, 1972, and Socialist Perspectives, 1983, with Phyllis Jacobson. Okay. Now I'm going to read a bit about Isaac Deutscher. Who, it, whose namesake is uh, one of the, you know, the big uh, prizes in uh, Marxist and socialist scholarship is the uh, Isaac and Tamara Deutscher Prize, uh, who uh, gave, uh, who uh, distributes prizes to people whose uh, work is 
the, I guess, the cream of the crop of that year of uh, Marxist scholarship. Um, yeah, it says Isaac Deutscher was a Polish Marxist, writer, journalist, and political activist who moved to the United Kingdom before the outbreak of World War II. He is best known as a biographer of Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin and is a commentator on Soviet affairs. His three-volume biography of Trotsky was highly influential among the British New Left in the 1960s and 1970s. Okay, his biography on Wikipedia is very long, so I'm not going to read it. I'm not sh quite sure where Isaac Deutscher stood on uh, debates about the Soviet Union. I don't know if he was a, I think he was a degenerated worker state guy, uh, but he might have been, I don't think he was a state capitalist, and he definitely wasn't a bureaucratic collectivist uh, guy like uh, Julius Jacobson or Hal Draper or Max Shackman or any of the other people associated with the third camp. Um, so I'm going to just read this thing. I'm, I apologize if you found the uh, introduction tedious, but, you know, uh, I mean, hopefully it'll, uh, you know, get the juices flowing, prime the pump for some deep, deep listening into my beautiful and sexy voice. Okay. Isaac Deutscher, The Anatomy of an Apologist. This is from November 1965. Isaac Deutscher published his biography of Stalin 16 years ago. Since then, he has produced a small book on Russian trade unionism, several collections of essays and lectures, a three-volume biography of Trotsky, and scores of newspaper and magazine articles analyzing contemporary developments in the communist world. Not only is Deutscher a scholarly biographer and active political journalist, he also has had experience in the Polish communist and Trotskyist movements. This combination of qualifications has helped Deutscher gain a position of special eminence in the expanding world of Kremlinology. Deutscher's image of himself, skillfully conveyed in his writing, is that of the objective historian concerned with larger movements of social forces, the broad sweep of events. He shows an edge of disdain for, quote, political philosophers and moralists, end quote, who venture judgments other than his own, who see only the horror of Stalinism at the expense of larger historical perspectives. This is in parentheses. When asked recently whom he blames for the deterioration of the Russo-Chinese relations, I guess this is at the time of the Sino-Soviet split, or like a few years afterward, uh, Deutscher answered, quote, I don't blame either of them. I am an outsider. I simply analyze a process without apportioning blame or praise, end quote. It is perhaps this affected detachment that has enabled Deutscher to elude any precise political identification. Many anti-communist radicals take it for granted that he shares their anti-totalitarian passions, and not without apparent cause. After all, did he not author a sympathetic biography of Trotsky? And didn't his earlier political study of Stalin expose the Vazd falsification of history and the monstrosities known as the Moscow trials. Sorry, I have to look up that term real quick. People have complained when I do this, but I am learning myself and I am not an expert and I don't like when I see words that I don't know what they mean and then not looking them up. Okay, so according to Wikipedia, A Vaz is a Romanized f from Belarusian, Russian, and Ukrainian, blah, 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 literally meaning the quote guides person or the quote leader, is a historical title with etymology deriving from the Proto Slavic Vaz, I don't know what the hell that is, and thus common across Slavic languages. It's it originally denoted a chieftain of a tribe, whereas upon rise of statehood, it was used thereafter also in the context of a supreme leader and or supreme commander. 
in particular when both roles were combined in one person. In most Slavic languages, the official and colloquial usage of the designation has nowadays been discontinued in favor of at least two more precise derivatives, one meaning, quote, a leader, and another one, quote, a commander. Therefore, the original term may typically be encountered exclusively in historical or ironic context, I guess that's our context, otherwise occasionally only when referring to extent, extant foreign tribal communities. <laughs> Uh, actually, there's a poster on the Wikipedia page that says Agniok. Uh, I guess this is a book from the Soviet Union, or if it's a. Yeah. Agniok, 1934, cover featuring portraits of Stalin and Maxim Gorky, with a text that ends, quote, Thus did Comrade Stalin, beloved Vazd, of the world's proletariat, define the role of the Soviet writer. Okay, so we looked up Vazd. V-O-Z-H-D, if anybody is interested. Okay, so, back to the text. And didn't his earlier political study of Stalin expose the Vods, falsifications of history, and the monstrosities known as the Moscow Trials? Because of all this, expressed in a brilliant literary style laden with Western culture, Deutscher was widely seen as a Marxist historian in the authentic, socialist, anti-authoritarian tradition. This view is belied by a more thorough reading of his work. It is Deutscher's position that the special circumstances surrounding the Russian Revolution, cultural and economic primitiveness inherited from Tsarism, exhaustion after seven years of war and, of ci and civil war, defeat of the revolution in the West, necessitated the suppression of proletarian democracy in order to safeguard the basic social conquest of the revolution. This, for Deutscher, was the positive function of Stalinism, a function it fulfilled with excessive, historically superfluous brutality. Moreover, Stalinism, according to Deutscher, did not arise solely because of the revolution's adverse context. There is also operative, in his opinion, a law of revolution which dictates that the heroic period following all great revolutions must succumb to moral and physical fatigue. It then becomes the responsibility of a small elite to establish its dictatorial rule over the masses in order to smash the old order and consolidate the revolution, thereby permitting the eventual realization of the revolution's long-term social objectives. Stalinist terror, then, for all its excesses, preserved the basic conquests of October 1917, just as Cromwell's dictatorship over the nation consolidated the social rule of the British bourgeoisie. The analogy is Deutscher's. This historical rationalization for Stalinism is not confined to Russia. There is also the parallel apologia for the Stalinist conquest of Eastern Europe, where Napoleon brought the revolution to much of Europe on the points of French, excuse me, on the points of French bayonets. So did Stalin bring the promise of socialism to other lands. Quote, in the turrets of Russian tanks, or turrets of Russian tanks. I don't know how you pronounce that. T-U-R-R-E-T-S, of Russian tanks, end quote, as Deutscher puts it. It becomes clear enough that the democracy Deutscher foresees has little to do with political freedom. What he proposes has the character of a benevolent dictatorship. This is not merely a critic's deduction, for, as if mulling over the consequences of his restrictive reading of democracy... Deutscher, later in, his, in this interview, notes of his promised democratic socialist Russia, quote, it may well be that what is coming won't take the form of a multi-party system, end quote. The discussion, excuse me, this discussion will document the charge that Deutscher's well-deserved reputation as a talented writer stands in marked contrast to his unwarranted reputation as an insightful analyst of specific events and changes in the communist world. Here his performance is replete with distortions, a biased selection of material, 
quotation marks around dialogue he never heard, unfulfilled predictions, statements which contradict the facts, and sometimes each other. <laughs> Sorry, my nose is running. To the defense, in times of crisis. In the United States, we have liberals who extol academic freedom at the same time as they deny communists their right to teach. This is the mark of the Cold War, quote, critic, whose, de whose liberalism collapses when confronted by threats to his basic social allegiances. It is oft also the, the mark of Isaac Deutscher. Often indignant over social injustice in Russia, he rushes to the defense of the, quote, autocratic socialist, end quote, system whenever its viability is threatened. This happened during the June 1953 uprising of the Berlin workers, during the Hungarian Revolution, and in the Polish upheavals of 1956-57. to 57. The Berlin barricades has hardly been overrun by Russian tanks on the Stalin Alley. I don't know how you say that. I guess street? Stalin Alley. Uh, A-L-L-E-E. -E, when Deutscher rushed into print with an article in the English paper, The, New Chron the News Chronicle, on July 13, 1953, repudiating the action of the Berlin workers. Quote, the Germans who on June 16th to 17th descended on the streets, assailed the people's police, and met Russian tanks with a hail of stones, may have had their genuine and long-suppressed grievances which demanded an outlet. Nevertheless, their action had unfortunate consequences in Moscow. It compromised the men who stood for reform and, re and conciliation. It gave fresh vigor to the diehards of Stalinism and other irreconcilables, end quote. Thus the German workers not only committed a disservice to themselves, they compromised the movement for reform throughout the communist world. They should have been more patient and trusted Deutscher's assurances that there were men in Moscow now who were prepared to write justifiable grievances. Reform would come from above and all in good time. Deutscher describes the socialism he sees in Russia and East Europe as, quote, autocratic socialism, as contradictory a phrase as, quote, totalitarian freedom. However, the terror by, quote, raising Russia from the plow to the tractor, end quote, planted and nourished the seeds of its own destruction since terror became an obstacle to the continuing economic growth of an industrialized nation. The institutions of terror are dismantled and liberalization effectuated, though slowly and somewhat unevenly. Thus, democracy will come to Russia primarily from above, with the party of socialist terror transformed into an instrument of socialist democratization. In an essay written in 1957 for his Russia in Transition, Deutscher wrote that in the immediate post-Stalin period, political relaxation, quote, could come only through reform from above, end quote. And that, quote, reform from above could be the work of Stalinists only, end quote. By 1957, Deutscher still feared that, quote, a spontaneous mass movement, end quote, for freedom could only become a factor of social disruption and chaos. Mass pressure on the Kremlin could acquire a, quote, very stormy momentum, end quote, not in accord with Deutscher's delicate historical timetable and the whole process of democratization reversed. History cannot be rushed. It put one it puts one in mind of those who urge gradualism and moderation in the American South. There too, we are told, that history cannot be rushed by impatient Negroes who want their freedom now. However, the quote, democracy, that Deutscher sees as the glorious culmination of reforms from above in Russia is somewhat lacking in democratic content. In a recent remarkable inter interview, appearing in The Review, Volume 3, Number 3, 1963, published by the Imre Naj Institute, some details of his vision of a democratic socialist Russia are revealed. 
Imre Naj was the... I think I thought he was the reformist uh, guy that they that, like they were advocate... that was advocated for in the 1956 Hungarian uh, uprising. Um, I'm not sure much about his biography or what this institute is, but... <sighs> the name is spelled I-M-R-E... N-A-G-Y. I believe it's Imre Naj. I can't be certain about that, though. Anyway, he says there some details of his de vision of a democratic socialist Russia. Quote, To speak about tolerating social democracy in Russia is a completely unreal question. In abstracto, I would say that after nearly 50 years, the Russian Revolution should be able to tolerate any party. But after nearly 50 years, a social democratic party can hardly exist in Russia. It is just as if you wanted to resurrect in the England of today the parties that existed before the Wars of the Roses. Social democracy makes sense only within the capitalist order because the, quote, ideological, end quote, difference between the social democrats and the communists is, or was, whether capitalism can be overthrown only by revolution or whether it can be transformed peacefully into socialism. If what you, the interviewer, have in mind is freedom of debate, freedom of criticism, freedom of expression, freedom of association, well, I think this is what communism must accept, will accept, and is driven to accept, exclamation point, dot, 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 I believe that Russia is ripe, or nearly ripe, even for a multi-party system. By this, I do not mean anything like a reproduction of the multi-party systems of the bourgeois West, but a political regime in which there would be room for various trends and various programs, all based on the foundations of the revolution. Dot, 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 end quote. There is no room in Russia for bourgeois parties since obviously they could not be, quote, based on the foundations of the revolution, end quote, according to Deutscher in an interview from the Review, Volume 5, Number 3, 1963. No room for a Russian equivalent of the British Labor Party or other social democratic parties, nor room for, quote, anything like the multi-party system of the bourgeois West, and if, as is clearly implied, there is room only for various, quote, trends based on his vague, quote, foundations foundations of the revolution, what remains of his envisioned freedom of debate and criticism that is politically meaningful. Indeed, one of the, quote, foundations of the bracket socialist, end bracket, revolution, end quote, is precisely the right of opposition parties to exist and legally challenge the leading position of the party in power. Deutscher overlooked a number of facts. The Berlin Revolt, spearheaded by the building trades workers, began as a protest against a decree on May 10, 1953, increasing their production norms by 10%. This new oppressive order was put into effect several months after Stalin's death at a time when Deutscher assured readers of his Russia, What Next?, published in, 1930, in, excuse me, in 1953, that the new day of liberalization from above was already underway in the communist world. It is also important to note that on the 29th of July, the intensified production quota was cut down, and on July 31st, two days after Berea's fall, whose execution, according to Deutscher, was symptomatic of a new Stalinist resurgence brought on by the Berlin Revolt. German reparations were sharply reduced. These concessions won by the German workers could hardly have been gained so readily had they passively awaited the benefits of Deutscher's promised liberalization from above. Partly to justify his opposition to the Berlin workers, Deutscher has written articles on Germany which, despite his talents, are simply bizarre. In 1962, in The Observer, he wrote that Malenkov and Berea, quote, advocated a unilateral Russian withdrawal, end quote, even if the Americans would not pull out of West Germany, exclamation point. Moreover, Malenkov and Berea, quote, took it for granted that this, parenthesis, Russian withdrawal from East Germany, end parenthesis, would mean the end of communist rule in East Germany, dot, 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 end quote. 
Deutscher's fantasy includes, quote, the partly hypothetical interpretation, end quote, that after Khrushchev was in power and the rift with China already a several, excuse me, already of several years duration, Khrushchev was, quote, seeking to provoke Ulbricht into switching his allegiance, end quote. From Moscow to Peking, which would permit Khrushchev to carry out a, quote, withdrawal to the odor and Nysa with relatively little loss of face, end quote. Um, Ulbricht, if you don't know, was the first uh, uh, premier of uh, the GDR, um, East Germany. There is method to Deutscher's fantasy. He is not only minimizing the force of Russian imperialism, but is trying to bolster his thesis that it is self-defeating for those under the Russian yoke to defy the Kremlin. That is why he wrote, nine years after the Berlin events, that, quote, the Berlin rising on June 16th to 17th saved Ulbricht, end quote. It is now 12 years since the uprising, and Ulbricht is still there, although the German workers have made no break for freedom since 1953, not even during the Hungarian Revolution. How long must they be penalized for having flouted Deutscher's dictum that they can be delivered from oppression only by their oppressors? In, July, in, me, in October 1956, the month of the Hungarian Revolution, an article by Isaac Deutscher described Kremlin satellite relations as follows. Quote, the Soviet worker has begun to, quote, finance in all earnestness the industrialization of the underdeveloped communist countries, and he, quote, finances it, out of the resources which might otherwise have been used to raise his own standard of living, dot, dot, dot. Here, indeed, two aspects of de-Stalinization, Russian domestic reform and reform in Russia's relation with the entire Soviet bloc, can be seen in actual conflict with each other. End quote. Partisan Review, Fall 1956, Deutscher. These euphoric lines about Russia's benevolence and sacrifices by Russian workers, no less, were written by Deutscher just before the Hungarian Revolution. They were in keeping with his glamorized view of Stalinist conquest of Hungary and Poland expressed earlier in Stalin, a political biography. Quote, in Poland and Hungary, the communist-inspired land reform fulfilled perhaps imperfectly a dream of many generations of peasants and intellectuals, end quote. Now compare the quotation from the Partisan Review and from Stalin with the following, written when the smoke of revolution was still smoldering in Budapest and the countryside, quote, Yet the Poles and Hungarians struggled for political freedom as well as for national emancipation, and they rose against the Stalinist police state through which Russia had dominated them. Last but not least, they revolted against an economic policy that had sacrificed their consumer interests to industrialization and armaments and had plunged them into intolerable misery, end quote. All emphases in quotations in this chapter have been added unless otherwise noted. One could have brought, excuse me, one could have bought on the same day and from the same newsstand both the fall 1956 issue of Partisan Review and the November 15, 1956 issue of The Reporter. In the former, he would have read with relief or amusement Deutscher's statement that the Russian, quote, workers and a benevolent Kremlin were sacrificing themselves for the sake of raising the living standards in underdeveloped communist nations. Then the reader would have opened the pages of the reporter and there have learned from the same Isaac Deutscher that the people of Poland and Hungary were in revolt because they were plunged into intolerable misery by the Russian-dominated police state. Deutscher's evaluation of Russo's satellite relations in his later reporter article was not in the spirit of self-correction. He seldom admits to errors of judgment or analysis, nor should the reader confuse his sudden compassion for the Hungarian people with support of their revolution, 
In the same article in which he admitted to the misery which provoked the Hungarian people to armed insurrection, he condemned the revolution itself. There he wrote that the revolution began as an effort to, quote, regenerate the communist revolution, end quote, but subsequent Hungarian Stalinist provocation and armed Russian intervention permitted anti-communists to win the initiative in Hungary, at which point, quote, a Thermidorian situation arose, end quote. Of course, there was no communist revolution in post-war Hungary for anyone to regenerate, only a dictatorship imposed by force of foreign Russian arms. But we will let this pass for the moment. More relevant at this point is Deutscher's summary judgment, which appeared in his Russia in Transition. Quote, It may be said that in October-November, the people of Hungary in a heroic frenzy tried unwittingly to put the clock back while Moscow sought once again to wind up with the bayonet, or rather with the tank, the broken clock of the Hungarian Communist Revolution. It is difficult to say who it was who acted the more tragic and the more futile or hopeless role. End quote. The Hungarians, driven to heroic frenzy by justifiable grievances, were unwittingly turning back the clock of revolutionary progress as the insurrection moved into its counter-revolutionary, quote, Thermidorian phase, with the Russian, excuse me, while the Russians sought to rewind the clock with bayonets. Not content with paradoxical clocks, Deutscher also repeated in more civilized and temperate manner some of the most malicious communist canards against the Hungarian revolution. Quote, the ascendancy of anti-communism found its spectacular climax with Cardinal Min Zenti's triumphal entry into Budapest to the accompaniment of the bells of all the churches of the city broadcast for the whole world to hear. The cardinal became the spiritual head of the insurrection, a word of his now carried more weight than Naj's appeals. If in the classical revolution the political initiative shifts rapidly from right to left, here it shifted even more rapidly from left to right. Parties suppressed years ago sprang back into being, among them the formidable Small Holders Party, end quote. The Reporter, November 15, 1956. More slander could not be compressed into so few lines. Deutscher, notwithstanding one of the more illuminating aspects of the Hungarian Revolution, was the rapidity with which the persecuted clerical prince of, of this overwhelmingly Catholic nation was eclipsed by a revolution which he could neither fully accept nor reject nor even understand. Incidentally, does Deutscher think that winding up the clock of progress means keeping priests in jail regardless of the charge or guilt? Upon his release from prison, Menzenti baptized the revolution with the cold water of doubt, equivocation, confusion, and contradiction. Menzenti, excuse me, Menzenti realized that there could be no return to the old order, and perhaps he did not want it, so he told the people that he was in favor of a, quote, classless society, and supported, quote, justified historical development. That he could not speak in or accept the Marxist idiom so repugnant to him, so he spoke also of the need to return to, quote, private ownership, but immediately qualified with, this, with, this, with the stipulation that it would be private ownership, quote, restricted by the interest of society and justice, end quote. Listen for a moment to how Deutscher's confused, quote, spiritual head, end quote, addressed his revolutionary flock with the artificial voice of Christian charity and tolerance, so out of keeping with the temper of an embittered, imprisoned people locked in deadly combat with their jailers. Quote, Private revenge has to be avoided and eliminated. Those who have participated in the fallen regime carry their own responsibility for their activities, omissions, defaults, or wrongdoings. I do not want to make a single denunciatory statement because this would retard the start of work and the course of production in the country. If things proceed decently according to promises made, this will not, by, this will not be my task." End quote. Minzenti, M-I-N-D, 
S-Z-E-N-T-Y. Do these lines sound like the militant call to arms of the ascending, quote, spiritual head of a, quote, counter-revolution? Or are they the irrelevant pieties of a man soon pushed off stage into the winds of history by a revolution which gave him no more than an enigmatic nod? The slander spread by Stalinists that Minzenti finally presided over the revolution was motivated by such malice that Jean-Paul Sartre, hardly an enemy of communism, was moved to write the following, quote, As regards Cardinal Minzenti, the Stalinist press has made him into its bugbear, but it is not enough to reproduce the words of an old man worn out by suffering and strongly motivated by his resentments to discover behind him an army of fascists ready to act which are the forces he relied upon or was believed to rely upon question mark he had been isolated from the world for eight years then suddenly freed can we believe that he had a clear idea of the situation the communist press wanted to see a deep connection between his dreary voice which drawled over the radio waves and the slaughter that went on in the sewers Those who believed this were moved by emotion. Only Stalinist paranoia prevents them from seeing the truth. That is, this old isolated priest and those headhunters are separated by an immense gap. End quote. Tem Modern. Jean-Paul Sartre. The revolution did move in October and November steadily leftward in a socialist and therefore anti-Stalinist and anti-capitalist direction. This opposition of the revolutionary workers' councils, the backbone of the revolution, something which escaped Deutscher to anything resembling a capitalist restoration in Hungary is or should be known to all. On October 28th, the workers' committee of Gaior declared, quote, we do not wish to return to the old capitalist system. We want an independent and socialist Hungary, end quote. On the same day, Radio Miskolk broadcast a revolutionary manifesto demanding, quote, a new provisional government, one truly democratic, sovereign, and independent, fighting for a free and socialist Hungary, excluding all ministers who served the Rakosi regime. End quote. Two days later, excuse me, two days later, Radio Zom Batali, S Z O M B A T H E L Y, broadcast the demands of the National Committee for County Voss. Quote, dot, dot, dot. We want a free, independent, and socialist Hungary headed by the government of Imre Naj, end quote. These are a minute sampling of the demands made early in the revolution. Had things shifted to the right by early November, the record is no less, no less clear. On November 2nd, the Workers' Council at Borsod, Abange, Zemplin County declared, quote, We will not return the land to landlords, nor the factories to capitalists, nor the mines to the mining barons, nor the army command to the Hortiest generals, end quote. Um, I believe that's how you say his name. Horty was the uh, authoritarian dictatorship uh, over Hungary. Um, I'm not sure how far it lasted into... I'm not really actually quite absolutely sure about its relationship to the Third Reich. I don't know if it was superseded or if it was just subsumed within... Uh, Subsumed within the, uh, the Nazis' expansion east. Um, not sure. No. Like for I think I think for example instance in like Austria, to my understanding, there was kind of like a Christian fascist government in place that was led by Dolphus, 
which I might be getting all this wrong, so just quote me on it, but I'm just thinking out loud for my own purposes of self-clarification. But that was like a Christian clerical fascist regime, not a Nazi regime. And I think when the Anschluss happened, when, uh, which is the uh, subsumption of... Uh, the subsumption of... Uh, Austria to Germany, uh, they were over. That was the the Christian clerical fascist uh, party was uh, displaced from power. I'm not exactly sure. I might be getting all that fucking wrong, but anyway. Anyway, end quote. When the Russians called upon the armed Hungarian forces in Duna. Pantella to surrender, the Revolutionary Military Command answered, quote, Duna Pantella is the foremost socialist town in Hungary. The workers will defend their own from fascist excesses, but also from Soviet troops. There are no counter-revolutionaries in the town, dot, 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 end quote. The Revolutionary University Students Committee proclaimed, quote, We want neither Stalinism nor capitalism. We want a truly democratic and truly socialist Hungary, completely independent from any other country, end quote. In November, the armed revolutionary youth called, quote, for a neutral, independent, democratic, and socialist Hungary, end quote. At approximately the same time, it became known that the fact, excuse me, that the Revolutionary Committee of Hungarian intellectuals believed that, quote, all the factories and the mines are the property of the workers, end quote. Quote. No, shit. Not quote. One of the most moving Hungarian appeals was transmitted by Radio Kossuth, K-O-S-S-O-T-H, on November 7th, the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. It was directed to the Russian soldiers, quote, soldiers, exclamation point. Your state was created at the cost of bloody fighting so that you could have freedom. Today is the 39th anniversary of that revolution. Why do you want to crush our liberty? You can see that it is not factory proprietors, not land owners, and not the bourgeoisie who have taken up arms against you, but the Hungarian people who are fighting desperately for the same rights you fought for in 1917." End quote. Ordinarily, Marxist socialists and Democrats consider the legalization of Stalinist repressed parties as one of the major achievements of the Hungarian Revolution and evidence of its radical maturity. It is interesting that Deutscher mentions by name only the, quote, formidable smallholders party, end quote. He conveniently overlooks the names of socialist and radical organizations which also sprang back to life. He also distorts the picture by describing the small holders party as, quote, formidable, end quote, which is not exactly the case in October, November 1956. Moreover, Deutscher ignores the change in this party. It had liberal and conservative wings before its suppression in 1918, which so sharply illustrates the progressive force of the revolution. In a speech to the reconstituted small holders party on October 31st, Bela Kovacs, one of its leading members and a minister in the Naj government, noted, quote, the party was full, excuse me, quote, the party has full rights to reassemble, but the question is whether on the reconstitution the party will proclaim the old ideas again. No one must dream of going back to the world of counts, bankers, and capitalists, that world is over once and for all, end quote. Um, Bella Kovacs. It's a, an interesting thing to note. Uh, I had a t <laughs> we're talking about, we're reading this, it's talking about Hungary. And um, it says Bella Kovacs. And then it says, uh, there's no going back to the worlds of counts. And I was thinking, I learned this the other day, that Bela Lugosi, who, as you know, played uh, Dracula the, in the 1930s and onward, uh, was uh, a, a Hungarian extraction, as is well known. But it's probably less well known that he had to leave 
uh, Hungary for, uh, I think he moved to Austria after leaving Hungary because of political repression in Hungary due to his involvement in uh, organizing a, uh, a stage actors union. So uh, fucking the Count Dracula is, uh, has a revolutionary credentials. <laughs> Apparently, also his uh, his animosity towards Boris Karloff, which is uh, which was presented in uh, the film Ed Wood with Johnny Depp, uh, directed by what the fuck is that guy's name? Fucking Edward Scissorhands, uh, Sleepy Hollow, Drac uh, Batman. What's that guy's name? Can't think of his fucking name. Anyway. Uh, the, the beef between Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, apparently, in that movie is uh, an extreme exaggeration. <laughs> but it is funny in the movie. I mean, if you're talking uh, in Ed Wood, where uh, he calls out, he, uh, someone asks him about Boris Karloff, and he, like, flips the fuck out. It's funny. Anyway... The, back to the quote that was just mentioned about the about the smallholders party quote the party has full rights to reassemble but the question is whether on reconstitution the party will proclaim the old ideas again uh, no one must dream of going back to the world of counts bankers and capitalists that world is over once and for all end quote this is hardly the voice of a bourge of bourgeois reaction encouraged by a thermidorian counter-revolution Deutscher also subjected anti-Stalinist militants like the Polish 1956 October to his unique style of abuse. In an interview conducted by Alexander uh, uh, Ziemny, Z-I-E-M-N-Y, which appeared in the Polish weekly, Swiat, on the 7th of October, 1957, an evening at Deutscher's, he accused the liberalized, i.e., quote, revisionist, end quote, Polish press of opening its pages to, quote, writers who try to justify the mistakes of pre-September regimes, end quote. To realize the enormity of this charge, one must understand that, quote, pre-September regimes, end quote, refers to fascistic Polish regimes before September 1939, of course, Deutscher does not, he cannot, name any Polish anti-Stalinist writers who were justifying anything that smacked of Pilsudskyism. Uh, Pilsudski was the great, uh, um, like, the founding followers of, like, contemporary Poland. He's, like, a hero in Poland. He's, like, a, <laughs> like, in, like, a George Washington of Poland or something like that. I don't know if he was particularly reactionary. I think he was just kind of like a liberal nationalist. I don't think he was like an ethnic nationalist or anything, but I think fucking reactionary shit definitely did happen in his regime. I'm not exactly sure on that, so maybe I'm fucking wrong about the extent of uh, Pilsudski's uh, anti-progressive nature. But uh, anyway, that's who... To explain what Pilsudskyism is, you know, I'll just say that. Just as he could give no documentation for his charge that a reactionary church hierarch had become the spiritual head of the Hungarian Revolution. In the interview, he went on to speak contemptuously of the rebellious Polish youth who were attracted to Marxism because they viewed it as a, quote, religion of social justice, end quote. Instead of viewing Marxism in this humanist light and acting accordingly, Deutscher urges them to spend time studying the, quote, scholarly treasures, end quote, of Marxism. This quietism which he advocates is logically followed by his rebuke to those young Poles who don't realize, as he does, that, quote, de-Stalinization is the work of people brought up in the Stalinist school, and with this fact one has to come to terms regardless of any subjective speculation, end quote. As for Polish rebels who preferred self-reliance to Deutscher's promised reform from above, he found many of them guilty of, quote, cocky and loud-mouthed criticism. Deutscher's real function as critical rationalizer of totalitarianism did not escape Polish anti-Stalinists who followed his work. 
and a short rebuke to Deutscher for his advocacy of quietism as against militant active opposition to Stalinism, one Polish writer, Andrzej Braun, uh, that's spelled A-N-D-R-E-Z-J, Braun, wrote a polemic in Nova Cultura, in 1957, which accurately accused Deutscher of proposing, quote, a position alien to action, end quote, which, quote, would mean here, bracket, in Poland, agreement with, the all, with all the evil around us, end quote. All right, I'm going to take a break. I have to pee really bad, and it's freezing outside. Deutscher and Marginal Slave Labor There is a vast body of literature available on Russian concentration camps, penned by former inmates, defectors from the Kremlin apparatus, and by scholars throughout the world. One student of Russian affairs, though, who has been reluctant to discuss the details of this singularly atrocious aspect of Stalinism is Isaac Deutscher. Deutscher reserves, reserved his most detailed comments about the facts of the camps for a lesser work, Russia, what next? It is worth quoting his discussion almost in its entirety. Quote, how much of Russia's industrial expansion has been due to planning, and how much has been achieved by, for instance, the use of forced labor? Quote, it is important to make a distinction between the fundamental elements of the Soviet economy and its marginal phenomenon. A few years ago, the number of inmates of Soviet concentration camps was most implausibly estimated by Western commentators from 12 to 20 million. If these figures were correct, the whole Soviet experiment in planning would be only of negative significance to the rest of the world, for it would represent nothing but the recrudescence of slavery on a staggering scale. However, much laborious research and some evidence from inside Russia have reduced these speculative figures to more plausible proportions. Dr. J.M. Jasny, excuse me, M.N. Jasny, for instance, an able but also a most extreme Menshevik critic of Stalinist economic policies, has reached the conclusion that at the height of the deportations, the total number of inmates to those camps may have amounted to three or four million. Morally, this makes little difference. The use of forced labor is equally repugnant and its condemnation equally valid, whether four or twenty million people are involved. But a more precise idea of the dimensions of the problem helps to bring the economic picture of the Stalin era into more realistic focus. It disposes of the theory that the, state, the Soviet economy could not function without forced labor. Quote, In an economy in which the total number of workers and employees is about 40 million, it was over three, 30, excuse me, quote, in an economy in which the total number of workers and employees is about 40 million, it, would, it was over 30 million before the Second World War, and in the further scores of millions work on collective farms, the labor of 4 million convicts is a marginal factor. The brunt of the industrialization has been borne by a working class which has been severely regimented, disciplined, and directed, but which is essentially a normal working class. Having duly registered his repugnance at the fact of slave labor, Deutscher promptly accentuates it out of any significance. 
The fact that slavery might account for a mere 10% of the labor force is morally deplorable, at least repugnant, but of little historical significance because the economy could function without it. The naivete of this dissociation between slave labor and planning is truly remarkable. If the number, function, and location of slave labor was part of some plan, how is it possible to know whether the Soviet economy could have functioned without it? Was Russia a modern slave state, as some have called it? No, says Deutscher. It had only three million, not four million slaves. Give him a minimum of 12 million, and he is ready to recognize Russia as, quote, nothing but a recrudescence of slavery on a staggering scale, end quote. But if the difference... It, if the difference between 4 million and 12 million slaves is so decisive for his evaluation of Russian society, how then account for his Olympian dismissal of the, quote, Western commentators with their big numbers without as much as nodding a nodding analysis or refutation of what he claims to be the fundamental fallaciousness of their figures? Deutscher prefers the 3 million to 4 million figure mentioned by, quote, most extreme Menshevik, end quote, Naum Jasny, N-A-U-M-J-A-S-N-Y. While Mr. Jasny is a Menshevik, he is not a, quote, most extreme, end quote, or an average extreme Menshevik. Deutscher tacks this on for a clear enough purpose. If even a, quote, most extreme, end quote, anti-communist downgrades the number of slave camp inmates, then surely he is closer to the mark than those who see larger, much larger figures. If Deutscher were more concerned with truth than scoring an apologist's point, he might have bothered to investigate Jasny's method of arriving at his figure. In this case, he would have been obliged also in the interest of truth to report some basic flaws in Jasny's article. One of the most glaring defects in Jasny's calculations is that they were based on an economic report of 1941, 1941, 10 years before his article appeared and 12 years before Deutscher's. In the period immediately before, during and after the war, there were vast numbers, possibly millions of East Europeans, Baltic peoples, national minorities in Russia, those from the Balkans, in addition to Russian soldiers who had to be re-educated after their contact with Western decadents, who were shipped off to slave labor camps. These numbers do not enter Jasny's estimate. If we, are, if we were to add the post-1941 recruits to slave labor armies, the figure would swell enormously. While Jasny did not estimate the number of those who flooded the slave labor camps after 1940, he did acknowledge that they arrived in mass. Deutscher also fails to mention Jasny's reservation that his estimated figure, quote, does not include children, full invalids, people too old to work, etc. I have no evidence by which to estimate them, end quote. Since Jasny is interested in arriving at the truth, he footnotes his failure to include children, invalids, and old people in his estimates by noting that one of David Dallin's sources, a former chief of police of a large concentration camp, testified that only 50% to 60% of the inmates in his camp were engaged in productive labor. The results were, excuse me, the rest were invalids in hospitals, engaged in various services, etc. If this was typical of the Russian slave labor camps, then Jasny's figures would indeed have been a serious underestimation. Deutscher's cursory discussion of slave labor camps is typical of his method. By omission and commission, he misinforms his readers about the tangible realities of virtually every sensitive area of contemporary Russian life. In a 1959 lecture printed in his collection, The Great Contest, Deutscher could say that today the Russian worker, quote, cannot be punished for minor industrial offenses or branded as an enemy of the people when he tries to speak out for himself, end quote. 
This was said at a time when thousands of comrade courts had already been set up on factory levels and were zealously exercising their explicit authority to punish minor industrial offenders. At the same time, many constituent union republics had already adopted their, quote, anti-parasite laws, soon extended to all of Russia, for the purpose of inflicting major punishments for minor sins. Sentences of up to five years of prison, exile, or, quote, corrective, end quote, labor were given to industrial offenders, to those who believed they could, quote, speak up, end quote, for themselves, and for other, quote, antisocial, end quote, behavior, e.g. writing poetry. When glamorizing Russia's economic growth, Deutscher, in The Great Contest, asserts that in 10 years, i.e. by 1969, Soviet standards of living, quote, are certain to have risen above Western European standards, end quote. Or he writes of the, quote, New Deal for the working class, end quote, with its, quote, promise, end quote, of a 30 to 35 hour work week sometime in the 60s. He discourses about the Kremlin's Quote, continuous efforts to increase the output of consumer goods faster than had been planned and to mitigate the appalling housing conditions, end quote. Deutscher is always guaranteeing the future up to the Russian people, on condition that they don't get too rambunctious and upset his calendar of reform. Why doesn't he support his optimism with some facts about living standards today? What is the average wage? What is the price of milk? butter and meat? What are housing conditions actually like and how much will they improve if housing plans are met? He seldom designs, excuse me, he so, seldom deigns to report and analyze such, quote, details, end quote, of Russian life. And on the rare occasion he does discuss facts, he usually accepts Russian sources at face value. When he writes of Russian legal reforms, he usually produces an abbreviated rosy progress report without any detailed study of the statutes, debates, and actual practice of the law. Surely the large number of death sentences meted out for, quote, economic crimes, end quote, deserve a serious, thoughtful article. What about the charges of Russian anti-Semitism? Deutscher is certainly familiar with the fact from his reading of the Russian press. How do systematic anti-Semitic acts sponsored by the, quote, reformers, end quote, in power fit his theory of Russia's organic evolution to socialist democracy? Instead of an honest confrontation with reality, Isaac Deutscher informed a London audience at a time when Russian anti-Semitism was already well documented that the resurgence of communist internationalism, quote, must provide a source of hope to Jews of all political convictions, end quote. Quoted in Leopold Labedet's recent article on Deutscher in the survey, April 14, 1962. This news will hardly console the families of the several hundred Jews who have been executed in, excuse me, who have since been executed in Russia. Historical novelist with the keyhole view. Deutscher's journalistic output reveals his talents as a historical novelist. He pretends access to closed councils of the Russian Communist Party, reports dialogue, quotation marks, and, and all, discloses the inner psychic drive of Kremlin leaders in a manner that would put a Freud to shame. The conscious yearnings of a Khrushchev or a Mikoyan Private thoughts which they could not even admit to themselves are laid bare by Deutscher's scapel like pen. To give Deutscher his due, his literary skill makes his little stories and vignettes spring to life. They are a veritable tour de force. Below are selections from his writings about the 20th Congress, an event that easily lends itself to fictionalized dramatization. Here is how Deutscher discussed Mikoyan's speech 
at the 20th Congress in The Reporter. Um, if you don't know, the 20th Congress is where Khrushchev uh, gave his uh, so-called secret speech, um, in which he uh, criticized Stalin as cultivating a cult of personality around himself and criticized the uh, terror. Um, mostly in so, to my understanding, mostly insofar as it applied to top-ranking Bolshevik officials, and uh, not to the far, much far-reaching uh, terror that affected more ordinary uh, Soviet citizens. Uh, to my understanding, uh, the history of the terror is in terms of how it affected uh, um, more co so-called common people. Uh, is usually underemphasized in the hist in the gen not in the historiography but kind of like in the general uh, colloquial understanding of uh, the the terror in the thirties. So so anyway, here is how Deutscher discussed Miko Jan's speech at the twentieth Congress in the Reporter, March twenty second, nineteen fifty six. Quote. When Miko Jan urged the Congress to wage a, quote, merciless struggle against, quote, bureaucratic centralism and for a full reinstatement of Lenin's, quote, democratic centralism, he consciously borrowed these terms as well as many other ideas and formulas from none other than Trotsky, who coined them. And it was in an almost characteristically Trotskyist manner that Miko Jan hinted at Lenin's testament, dot, 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 end quote. How does Deutscher, here the psychological dramatist, know that Miko Jan, quote, consciously borrowed, end quote, from Trotsky? He doesn't. But it makes exciting reading and serves his political purpose to write such nonsense. And what, incidentally, are the other ideas, quote, borrowed from Trotsky, end quote? But never mind, here is more insight gained from Miko Jan's speech and its reception. Quote, when Miko Jan finished, the Congress gave him an ovation such as it accorded no other leader, except Khrushchev and perhaps Bulganin. Bulganin, that's probably how you say it. But while Khrushchev and Bulganin received the homage due their offices and ranks, Miko Jan was applauded for what he had said and for the manner in which he had said it, end quote. It is as though Deutscher were equipped with some ultrasonic applausograph <laughs> device, which not only measures the volume of clapping from the Kremlin to the Surrey, but discloses the different motives behind each thunderous ovation. In the above quote, for example, Deutscher's applausograph tells him that Miko Jan and Khrushchev received the same stormy ovations, but it was the same in volume only, for the applausograph is so sensitive that it revealed that Miko Jan was cheered for, quote, for what he had said, and, quote, for the manner in which he had said it. Well, the same volume of applause for Khrushchev shows up on the applausograph screen as only the respect for his high position, the marvels of political science, exclamation point. Of course, this reading fits in well with Deutscher's political predilections. If Miko Jan is the real de-Stalinizer who, quote, consciously borrowed, end quote, ideas from Trotsky and is applauded for his views, it becomes confirming evidence of irresistible reforms from above. What raises Deutscher's applause analysis from the implausible to the absurd is his sentence which immediately precedes the above quotation. Quote, While many delegates certainly understood what Miko Jan was driving at and how far-reaching were the implications of what he said, the less informed missed the nuances and believed that Miko Jan merely towed with Krush the Krush excuse me, merely towed the Khrushchev line or that Khrushchev was in full agreement with Miko Jan, end quote. If the import of Miko Jan's near Trotskyist speech was missed by a number of delegates, what makes them, excuse me, that makes them near idiots, 
and if Mikoyan's differences with Khrushchev could only be detected by, quote, nuances, that makes Khrushchev a near Trotskyist. And how does this mesh with the applausograph recording? If the, quote, less informed, how many were there, thought that Mikoyan and Khrushchev were, quote, in full agreement, why should their applause for Mikoyan have a special significance as against their applause for Khrushchev? There is more to the Mikoyan saga. Quote, Mikoyan's speech is remark a remarkable political and human document, if only because he himself had been an ardent Stalinist at least since 1922, and Khrushchev and Kaganovich owed their careers entirely to Stalin. Mikoyan had risen in the party in Lenin's day, and his mind had been formed in Lenin's school, end quote. These two sentences are to soften one for what follows. Quote, His speech was something of an old Leninist recantation of the part he had played in helping Stalin's ascendancy. It was not a recantation in the familiar Stalinist style, but a seemingly genuine confession, if only implicit of grim and grave errors, and of a desire to undo some of the still rampant evils of Stalinism, end quote. The, quote, ardent Stalinist, end quote, since at least 1922 became a, quote, old Leninist, end quote, in just three miraculous sentences. This complex creature of Deutscher's imagination offers the world a confession which is, quote, seemingly genuine, end quote, although it is, quote, only implicit, end quote. How genuine was Mikoyan's, quote, desire to undo some of the still rampant evils of Stalinism, end quote, was exhibited seven months later when this penitent, ardent Stalinist, old Leninist, semi-Trotskyist played a special role in the slaughter of Hungarian revolutionaries. The chief antagonists of the 20th Congress, our recounter has told us, were Khrushchev and Mikoyan. The former feared too open and rash a break with Stalinism. The latter insisted upon it. Of this alleged controversy, Deutscher writes, quote, that Miko Jan was permitted to state his views from the platform of the Congress is in itself an important precedent. Again, this is no evidence yet of any real reinstatement of Leninist, quote, inner party democracy, end quote. In Lenin's day, when there were, was disagreement in the Central Committee over an important issue, it was customary for the majority to express its views in the official report of the Congress, while a spokesman of the minority came out with a frankly controversial, quote, counter-report, end quote. Miko Jan, it may be surmised, may have intended to come out with such a counter-report, but the Central Committee refused to permit at this stage any open clash between two members of the, quote, collective leadership, end quote. A compromise was reached, under which Miko Jan was allowed to state his views in a positive form without making it explicit where and on what points he dissented from Khrushchev, end quote. With this, Deutscher has taken us right into the closed sessions of the Russian Politburo, he speculates, quote, may be surmised, may have intended, dot, 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 end quote, that Miko Jan considered coming before the Congress with a minority report. This speculation is only an immodest way of saying that he, Isaac Deutscher, has no evidence that this was actually the case. This doesn't inhibit him from discussing his speculation in the very next breath as though it were a fact and telling us precisely how this surmised report was actually supposed to me was actually disposed of by the central committee. It is typical of Deutscher's leap from the speculative to the assertive. It is not enough for him to tell us what the response to this surmised counter-report might have been on the Central Committee. With the storyteller's skill, he takes us into the closed chambers of the Central Committee to tell us precisely how it decided to handle this breach in its ranks, how it effectuated a compromise, and exactly what Miko Jan was permitted to do. Deutscher, 
who has taken us on a guided tour of Miko Yan's subconscious, is a novelist with a keen sense of balance. What is performed with Miko Yan's psyche cannot be left undone with that of his alleged antagonist, Nikita Khrushchev. Thus, the Dostoevskian touch is supplied for him, too, in another chapter of his writings, also dealing with the 20th Congress. In Russia in Transition, he writes of Khrushchev, quote, How is it, one must ask, that a man of so sturdy a character of a mind, so inherently independent and so eruptive and untamable a temper, could at all survive under Stalin and survive at the very top of the Stalinist hierarchy? How did Khrushchev manage to control himself, to keep his thoughts to himself, and to hide his burning hatred from Stalin? How did he behave under the dictator's scrutinizing gaze when the dictator snarled at him? Quote, why do your eyes look so shifty today? End quote. Dot, dot, dot. In this minor and minor's son, risen to his present position, one can still feel something of that tenacious, patient, yet alert and shrewd spirit which once characterized the old Russian worker when from the underground he bored under the Tsar's throne. To that spirit are now joined new mental horizons, a new capacity for organization and an unwanted modernity. As one watches Khrushchev, even as I have watched him, with a certain bias against him, one comes to think that he is probably still the Russian or the Russo-Ukrainian worker writ large, the Russian worker who inwardly remained true to himself, even if the Stalinist straitjacket, who has over the years gathered strength and grown in stature and grown out of the straitjacket. One might even say that through Khrushchev, the old repressed socialist tradition of the Russian working class takes a long delayed and sly revenge on Stalinism. Yet Khrushchev also makes the impression of an actor who, while he plays his own part with superb self-assurance, is, is only half aware of his own place in the great complex and somber drama in which he has been involved. His long, aggressive monologue is a cry from the heart, a cry about the tragedy of the Russian Revolution and of the Bolshevik Party, but it is only a fragment of the tragedy, end quote. Khrushchev reminds Deutscher of the old Russian worker who bored under the Tsar's throne. He conveniently forgets that Khrushchev never bored under any throne, that although he was 23 years old at the time of the revolution, he did not participate in it and did not join the Communist Party until 1918. And his record in the party, Deutscher knows it all too well. But he cannot tell it here, for how would it fit into the picture of a man inwardly, quote, true to himself, end quote, with, quote, so sturdy a character, end quote, and of a, quote, mind so inherently independent, end quote. Deutscher does not tell us that from the very beginning, Khrushchev lined up with the Stalinists in the party, that for his voluntary services to the Stalinists in the early 20s, he was promoted by Kaganovich and later taken under Stalin's wing, that during the purges in the 30s, this Khrushchev was responsible for the deaths of thousands of real and imagined enemies of the Stalinist regime, that he was in charge of the purges in the Ukraine and soon became party secretary of the Ukraine and made a full member of Stalin's Politburo in 1939. And he does not see here the assassin of the Hungarian working class. Khrushchev's speech was a, quote, cry from the heart, a cry about the tragedy of the Russian Revolution and of the Bolshevik Party, end quote. This, however, is only, quote, a fragment of the tragedy, end quote. The other tragic fragment is soon unearthed. He, quote, he himself, Khrushchev, did not expect to burst out with this cry. Only a few days before he made the secret speech, he did not know that he was going to make it, or at any rate, he did not know what he was going to say, end quote. How does Deutscher know that Khrushchev did not know that he was going to burst forth this cry from the heart? The lyricist intuitive insights. How does this insight jibe with the story about Nico Jan's alleged, quote, counter-report, end quote, mentioned earlier? In that tale, 
The Central Committee refused to let Mikoyan make a report, quote, counter to Khrushchev's, which can only mean that the Central Committee knew about Khrushchev's report in advance and that certainly Mikoyan, Khrushchev's antagonist, remember, had a preview of it. Moreover, a few pages after, Deutscher reveals Khrushchev's tortured and indecisive frame of mind. He springs the following on us. Quote, Khrushchev builds his case against Stalin on three sets of facts. On Lenin's denunciation, in his testament, of Stalin's, quote, rudeness and disloyalty, end quote. On Stalin's role in the purges and on the faults of Stalin's leadership in the war. Under each count of the indictment, he treats the facts selectively so as to turn the evidence against Stalin rather than against the Stalinist faction, end quote. A legitimate and obvious point, but how does this, quote, selectively prepared speech correspond to the picture of Hamlet Khrushchev torn by indecision, not knowing if he should make the speech, or what kind of speech it should be, until a few days or a few moments before his, quote, impromptu, end quote, revelations. Not content to lead us into closed party meetings and take us on psychic tours of the Kremlin leaders, Deutscher probes and lays bare the mass psychology of the Russian people. To sell his readers on the seven-year plan, he assures them that, quote, the new plan undoubtedly gives the Soviet people the exhilarating sense of a tremendous social advance, end quote. We suspect that Deutscher was more exhilarated than the Russian people, but if he can be so all-knowing about the emotional responses of the entire Russian people in some instances, he can also admit to a revealing ignorance of mass psychology at other times, an ignorance which he insists is not unique to him. Thus, in an article which tries to discuss the ill-fated supercollectivization in China in an objective tone, he confesses his ignorance of how the Chinese peasants might react to this, quote, blow that Mao has struck against private property in the traditional way of life of rural China, end quote. And what Deutscher claims not to know, no one can know, not even those in Peking. Quote, it is difficult not only for outsiders and foreign travelers, but even for the rulers in Peking to judge what is going on in the hearts of a mass of half a billion people, end quote. How can Deutscher know what is going on in the souls of 200 million exhilarated Russians and be so dense about the collective inner mind of 500, 000, excuse me, 500 million Chinese victims of a brutal collectivization program? Deutscher versus Trotsky. It is sometimes thought that Deutscher's views on communism are akin to Leon Trotsky's. This misconception is due partly to Deutscher's sympathetic three-volume biography of Trotsky, but is also promoted <coughs> by the surface resemblance of Trotsky's definition of Russia as a, quote, degenerated worker state, to Deutscher's characterization of Russia as a form of, quote, autocratic socialism, end quote. The similarity is more, de more terminological than political. For whatever this writer believes to be the flaws, inconsistencies, and dangerous implications of Trotsky's theory, it seldom served to compromise his opposition to the Kremlin. His politics were infused with a democratic revolutionary consciousness absent in and alien to Deutscher. For Trotsky, the Kremlin was a totalitarian regime, quote, symmetrical to fascism, end quote. Trotsky scared, shared none of Deutscher's illusions that a democratic socialist society could emerge from a totalitarian incubus. On the contrary, Trotsky believed that the socialist regeneration of the October Revolution was contingent on the ability of the Russian people to destroy the Stalinist political system. Where he viewed the liberation of the working class as the job of the working class alone, Deutscher assigns a major share of this mission to the autocratic masters themselves. <laughs> 
It is the difference between one who would have hailed the Hungarian revolutionist and one who rationalized their, quote, historically progressive, end quote, Stalinist assassin. This difference was obliquely acknowledged by Deutscher himself in a remarkable passage in the last volume of his Trotsky biography, The Prophet Outcast. Trotsky wrote that if the Marxist program proved impracticable, it becomes, quote, self-evident that a new minimum program would be required to defend the interests of the slaves of the totalitarian bureaucratic system, end quote. <laughs> quote, the passage was characteristic of the man. If bureaucratic, if bureaucratic slavery was all that the future had in store for mankind, then he would be on the side of the slaves and not of the new exploiters. However, quote, historically necessary, end quote, the new exploitation might be, having lived all his life with the conviction that the advent of socialism was a scientifically established certainty, and that history was on the side of those who struggled for the emancipation of the exploited and the oppressed, he now entreated his disciples to remain on the side of the exploited and oppressed, even if history and all scientific certainties were against them. He at any rate would have Excuse me, he at any rate would be with Spartacus, not with Pompey and the Caesars. End quote. Deutscher. Here, Deutscher is not simply noting and admiring Trotsky's idealism. He is also summing up the difference between himself and a revolutionary who identifies with slaves, even should this fly in the face of, quote, all of history and all scientific certainties, end quote. For it is in deference to the alleged imperatives of history that Deutscher has fashioned his apologias for totalitarianism. The lack of coherent framework. Deutscher's reputation it, as a creative or original thinker has grown far out of proportion to his intellectual contributions. He has advanced no coherent conception of the Russian system, and in place of debate he perfunctorily dismisses views which are uncongenial to his teleological vision of Russia's drive for socialist self-fulfillment. In The Prophet Outcast, it did appear that Deutscher would break tradition and confront the arguments of those socialists who have long maintained that the Russian system is a new form of class exploitation, a bureaucratic collectivist totalitarian society antithetical to both socialism and capitalism. According to this theory, the nationalization of industry is an economic form whose progressive or retrograde character depends on who, quote, owns, end quote, the state that controls the nationalized economy. In summary fashion, the view is developed as follows. While economics is primary under capitalism, there is no simple one-to-one -one relationship of economic and political power. Fundamentally, the social power of the capitalist class inheres in the private ownership of the means of production in a profit-motivated market economy. But these narrow economic concerns can bring the capitalist class or sections of it into sharp conflict with a national capitalist political administration. In a nationalized economy, this limited autonomy of sometimes in... Excuse me. Excuse me. In a nationalized economy, this limited autonomy of parenthesis, sometimes antagonism between and parenthesis, economic forms and political institutions is largely dissipated. Politics and economics tend to fuse in a state that owns, controls, and plans the economy. Given this relationship, to describe a collectivized economy as being, quote, economically democratic, end quote, but, quote, politically dictatorial, end quote, becomes an illogical and reactionary notion. For the only manner in which a collectivized system can manifest any economic democracy is in the democratically organized political controls of that economy. A socialist state, then, presupposes the conscious political rule of the broad mass of people, which can be established only through political democracy. The exercise of free elections, competing political parties, right to recall, genuine trade unions, guaranteed civil rights, full cultural freedom, etc. <laughs> Conversely, in a state where the bourgeoisie has been expropriated and the, and the economy nationalized, but where the people are subjected to the domination and whims of to a totalitarian ruling party, we are confronted with a new form of political, therefore economic class oppression. In the Prophet Outcast, 
Deutscher presents a detailed review of the bureaucratic collectivist position, attributing its origins to the Italian leftist Bruno Risi, and its further development to a group of former American Trotskyists led by Max Schachtman and James Burnham. After his summary, one had reason to expect that Deutscher would try to expose what he believes to be the fallacies in their argument. Not only does he fail to give a battle, or at least provide a skirm me, provoke a skirmish, he doesn't even make contact with the enemy. Instead, he tries to dispose of the theory in a couple of sentences. In one sentence, he writes, quote, Implicitly or explicitly, they, Burnham and Shackman, attacked national ownership of industry and national planning, saying that these served as the foundations for bureaucratic collectivism and totalitarian slavery, end quote. This is absolutely untrue. Deutscher simply transformed the idea that the value socialists give to nationalization should depend on the political nature of the ruling powers to read the nationalization per se, excuse me, to read that nationalization, oh, Jesus Christ, I gotta repeat that whole sentence. Deutscher simply transformed the idea that the value socialists give to nationalization should depend on the political nature of the ruling powers to read that nationalization per se is evil. I know of no socialist with the bureaucratic collectivist view who doubts that nationalization and planning, as the economic corollaries of a socialist society, are a necessary but insufficient condition for socialism. His other sentence, meant to be damaging to the bureaucratic collectivist view, is, quote, Burnham, Schachtman and those who followed them found themselves rejecting the Marxist program point after point, end quote. Even if this were true, it is hardly a refutation of their views. In any case, it was not true. The bureaucratic collectivist view of Russia, which so heavily accents the indivisibility of socialism and democracy, is wholly in the Marxist-Leninist tradition and was presented in that light. It was Marx who wrote that, quote, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class to establish democracy, end quote. Engels explained that to accomplish the socialist revolution, quote, the proletariat seizes political power, end quote, and then, quote, turns the means of production into state property, end quote. And it was Lenin who wrote, as if anticipating Deutscher, that, quote, whoever wants to approach socialism by means other than that of political democracy will inevitably arrive at absurd and reactionary conclusions, end quote. If Deutscher discusses neither seriously nor competently views which he finds distasteful, and if he doesn't present any developed coherent picture of Russian society, that does not mean he avoids all characterization of the Russian social system. In fact, his characterizations of Russian society during the Stalin era are somewhat less than enlightening. In Stalin's defense of the nationalized forms of the Russian economy, Deutscher saw the progressive Marxist aspect of Stalinism. In Stalin's terrorism, he recognized aspects of barbarism. To define Russian society under Stalin, Deutscher simply adds socialism to barbarism, and there you have it. Stalinism was a form of socialist barbarism. In his words, Stalinism was, quote, the mongrel offspring of Marxism and primitive magic, end quote. Deutscher's more recent contributions to an understanding of Russian society after Stalin are hardly more illuminating. In an article explaining the failure of Khrushchevism, published in the Socialist Register in 1965, we are informed that what was a, quote, mongrel offspring, end quote, only yesterday, in which I believe he still considers a form of, quote, autocratic socialism, is today a society free of the maledictions of, quote, class conflict. In that article, comparing the extent of police persecution under the Tsar to police persecution today, Deutscher finds that, quote, evidently the antagonism between rulers and ruled is now different in kind, less fundamental, for it is not a class antagonism, end quote. 
I doubt that the Russian poets and writers recently sent to Siberian camps would be considerably warned by the thought that their persecution is less fundamental than the czarist exile of Dostoevsky to the same wintry region. But how less fundamental is this admitted antagonism between the rulers and ruled? And if the antagonism is not a class conflict, what sort of antagonism is it? Is it possible that in the three decades of barbaric and autocratic rule, the barbarians and autocrats in the Kremlin have not been able to develop the necessary degree of social cohesion to justify their definition as a ruling class? The disavowal of class conflict in Russia means, among other things, to displace the responsibility for conformity in Russian life from the shoulders of the rulers to those of the ruled. The conclusion is made by Deutscher himself in the same article, quote, It is not, much, is not so much police persecution that has prevented any progressive Soviet opposition from crystallizing and acting on a national scale, end quote. Instead, it is the, quote, apparent inability of those below, i.e. the masses, to exercise control, end quote, because they have not been able to overcome the stultifying effects that years of Stalin's rule, quote, have left in their political thinking and social initiative, end quote. How can Deutscher blame the Russian people for their oppressive circumstances? How can one so carelessly sweep under a, a historical rug the fact that, Despite unquestioned relaxation, Russia is still governed by a single party with opposition parties excluded by law. That fundamental criticism is made publicly, if made publicly, incurs the risk of jail or a madhouse. The free trade unions are prohibited and strikes outlawed. The cultural experimentalism is treated, excuse me, that cultural experimentalism is treated as subversive, and criticism made abroad as treason, the tens of thousands of Russians have in recent years been sent to labor camps. Excuse me, that tens of thousands of Russians have in recent years been sent to labor camps, jail, or exile as, quote, social parasites, end quote, etc. In fact, in, quote, the failure of Khrushchevism, Deutscher admits that in Russian universities, a number of clandestine opposition student groups were organized, quote, membership of which has been punished as high treason, end quote. He also admits that, quote, there has been no lack of industrial strikes, local street demonstrations, even food riots, end quote, in Russia, though he does not reveal that they were violently suppressed by the rulers of a country in which there, quote, is not a class antagonism, end quote. Stalinism and Bolshevism The study of Lenin and Bolshevism has become a national industry. At least half a dozen well-published volumes on these subjects have been dumped on the market recently, ranging from Robert Payne's hardcover comic book titled The Life and Death of Lenin to Lewis Fisher's ponderous misunderstanding of The Life of Lenin, Although the quality of these works varies, they usually share in their estimates of Leninism as a totalitarian doctrine, of the Bolshevik Revolution as a minority coup d'etat, and of the emergence of Stalinism and its concomitant barbarities as the natural heir to Leninism and the Russian Revolution. While Isaac Deutscher shows nothing but contempt for many of these Sovietologists, he has far more in common with them than he, could, he would like to think. For Deutscher, too, believes that in basic respects, Stalinism was continuous with Leninism, though his judgments and political conclusions may differ. To the bourgeois critic of Bolshevism, the insistence that Stalinism flows from Leninism is used to expose the dangers of socialism. For the right-wing socialist critic, it reveals the pitfalls of revolutionary socialism. But for Deut Isaac Deutscher, who accepts the socialist legitimacy of the Russian Revolution, his qualified acceptance of the Leninism-Stalinism sequence is used as a qualified historical justification of Stalinism. The relationship between Leninism and Stalinism is not an academic question. At stake is the political and moral worth of socialism itself. <laughs> 
For if anything remotely resembling Stalinist terror can be proved to be a necessary accomplishment of socialism, then socialism itself becomes an unworthy and an evil objective. However, nothing in Deutscher's discussion of the Leninist-Stalinist relationship is sufficiently convincing to weaken one's socialist convictions. In his Russia, What Next?, Deutscher demonstrated the terrible confusion that follows from arguing that the basic conquests won by the Bolsheviks were continued and guarded by Stalinism. Quote, Stalinism developed out of Leninism, preserving some of the features of Leninism and discarding others. It continued in the Leninist tradition, but it also stood in a bitter and unavowed opposition to it. End quote. To stand in bitter and unavowed opposition to a tradition and at the same time to continue that tradition is another of Deutscher's dialectical acrobatics. The proposition imposes the responsibility of clarification which he attempts later in the same book. Quote, if in one fundamental respect Stalin did of course continue Lenin's work, he strove to preserve the state founded by Lenin and to increase its might. He also preserved and then expanded the nationalized and state-managed industry, in which the Bolsheviks saw the basic framework of their new society. These important threads of continuity between Leninism and Stalinism were never cut, end quote. So there are threads, at least, of continuity. The first is that Stalin tried to preserve and strengthen the state. The question remains, however, what was the nature of that state? The term state is an abstraction, and the truism that all of rulers try to strengthen their states hardly suggests a common bond or continuity between capitalist and socialist societies or between Leninism and Stalinism. The second thread that Deutscher spins, Stalin, quote, also preserved, dot, 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 end quote, is Stalin's dual, excuse me, st Stalin's loyalty to nationalized property. No one can question this. Both Lenin and Stalin believed in the basic importance of state-managed industries. But why is this a continuity with Leninism or the Leninist tradition which implies ideas, principles, programs, and methods which define Lenin and his followers? Deutscher cannot tell us concretely how Stalin preserved the Leninist state if only because in passing he does accurately note some of the essential elements of this same Leninist state. Quote, But Leninism has... Excuse me, quote, but Leninism also committed itself in 1917 and afterward to respect, to guard, to promote, and to extend in every possible way the political freedom of the working classes, who should have been the real masters in the new state. This was the meaning of, quote, proletarian democracy, end quote, which should have supplemented or rather formed the basis of the dictatorship, end quote. Deutscher was never more correct. Leninism meant the political freedom of the working class and the, quote, meaning and the, quote, basis of proletarian democracy or proletarian dictatorship is that the politically free working class should be the, quote, real masters in the new state, end quote. In what respect, then, did Stalin continue the Leninist state if he destroyed its very basis, proletarian democracy? We should also point out that immediately after the passage informing the reader that Stalin preserved in one fundamental respect the Leninist state, Deutscher continues, quote, But when Stalin took over the state, its direction was in such a condition that it could be preserved only by being politically refashioned almost into its opposite, dot, dot, dot. Oh, sorry, that's not dot, dot, dot. That's just dot equal. I, I don't know. My eyes fucked up for a second. The picture is now complete and utterly incomprehensible. For in a dozen pages, Deutscher has flung the following contradictory propositions and conclusion at his readers without the slightest display of self-doubt. A. Stalinism continued in the Leninist tradition. Stalinism stood in bitter opposition to Leninism. B. The Leninist state was inseparable from proletarian democracy. Stalin politically refashioned the Leninist state, quote, almost into its opposite, end quote. Conclusion. C. Stalin, in a, quote, fundamental respect, end quote, preserved and extended the Leninist state. 
bourgeois and socialist revolutions. Deutscher's apologia for communist totalitarianism is firmly woven into an elitist philosophy which rejects the socialist conception that the broad mass of people can emerge triumphant from a revolutionary struggle. Retaining its elan and ability to manage its own affairs, instead he promulgates a virtual law of revolution according to which, quote, each revolution begins with a phenomenal outburst of popular energy, impatience, anger, and hope. Each ends in the weariness, exhaustion, and disillusionment of the revolutionary people, end quote. While the people are exhausted, quote, the party of the revolution knows no retreat. It has been driven to its presence past, largely through obeying the will of the same people by which it is now deserted. It will go on doing what it considers to be its duty, without paying much heed to the voice of the people. In the end, it will muzzle and stifle that voice, end quote. Moreover, quote, the rulers acquire the habits of arbitrary government and themselves come to be governed by their own habits. What had hopefully begun as a great warm-hearted popular venture gradually degenerates into a narrow and cold autocracy, end quote. Stalin, a political bi biography. Thus, a, quote, narrow and cold autocracy would have arisen in Russia under the best of post-revolutionary circumstances. Backwardness, primitivism, and isolation only served to accelerate the degenerative process and to foreshorten the revolution's heroic period. It became utopian. Excuse me. It becomes utopian sentimentality not to realize that quote the calendar of revolution end quote one of Deutscher's favorite expressions required the rule of the a dictatorial elite to govern Russia in the long-term interests of the people and to prevent the revolution from shifting into reverse gear. The weight of historic evidence is certainly on Deutscher's side. The great revolutions of the past were made in the name of popular causes and gathered enormous mass support. Yet in each case, in England, in France, as well as in Belgium, in England, in France, as well as in Russia, a victorious elite emerged which violated the revolution's proclaimed democratic principles and institutions and eventually repressed the revolutionary peoples themselves. If Deutscher is correct, that this is an inevitable historical pattern from which not even a socialist revolution can be exerted, then again socialism must be rejected as a hopelessly archaic, utopian and dangerous package for the very heart of marxist politics is a reliance on the ability of the working class to regulate its own affairs related to this law of revolution is the grand parallel deutscher finds between the russian revolution and the english and french bourgeois revolutions the parallel is repeated in each of deutscher's books and in many of his essays in the french revolution above all he finds quote the passions, the spirit, and the language of the Russian Revolution. This is true to such an extent that it is absolutely necessary for the student of recent Russian history to view it every now and then through the French prism, end quote. Russia in transition. Deutscher sees the French and Russian revolutions as having established the power of socially progressive forces. Both revolutions revealed initial egalitarian democratic impulses and mass enthusiasm. But even the force of the law of revolution, neither the Jacobins nor the Bolsheviks could possibly meet the expectations of the multitudes they inspired and led. The frustrated French plebeians grew as disillusioned with the intangible results of their sacrifices as the Russian working class grew apathetic and even hostile toward a Bolshevik party that could provide it with none of the material benefits for which so much blood was shed. Consequently, the popular democratic phase of the, Rush of the French Revolution, which reaches, which reaches apex with the Jacobin triumph in 1793, inevitably succumbed first to the Thermidor and then to Bonapartism. Similarly, the analogy goes, the Russian Revolution reached its inspirational heights in the first years of Bolshevik rule, only to give way to one-party dictatorship and then to one-man tyrannical rule. The analogy continues, although Napoleon crowned himself emperor, he neither wanted nor could reverse the rising power of the French bourgeoisie established in the heroic period of 1789 to 1793, on the contrary, 
Napoleon defended the basic social objectives of the French Revolution at the necessary expense of its egalitarianism. Similarly, Stalin dissipated the egalitarianism of Russia's October Revolution, emerging as a personally fiendish dictator who nevertheless defended the socialist interests of the very working class he brutalized by preserving, consolidating, and extending nationalized urban property within and without Russian borders. Therefore, in Deutscher's view, quote, the Russian counterparts to the Jacobin Thermidorian Bonapartist phases of the bracket French and bracket revolution have in a curious way overlapped and emerged in Stalinism. End quote. Thus, Stalin becomes a curious sort of socialist Napoleon, and his political personality is even more complex since he also emerges in Deutscher's writings as a barbaric kind of socialist Robespierre. Or, depending on the specific national historical focus of the analogy, Stalin is always, in a qualified and curious way, reminiscent of Cromwell, Bismarck, a blend of the, quote, Leninist and Ivan the Terrible, end quote, among other star billings, including the Emperor Constantine. Deutscher acknowledges that there are limits to the analogy. In the first paragraph of his essay, Two Revolutions, wholly concerned with an analogy of the French and communist revolutions, he counsels his reader that, quote, in drawing any analogy, it is important to know where the analogy ends, end quote. And he hopes not to, quote, offend badly against this rule, end quote. This promising beginning is followed by a series of comparisons between the two revolutions, some interesting, others preposterous, but no indication of where the analogy finds its limit. Yet, it is the incongruities far more than the similarities which sharpen the socialist image by way of contrast. What these differences reveal is that the Russian socialist revolution represented a much sharper and more profound break with the past than was the case with the French bourgeois revolution. It is worth noting some of the important differences. A. The revolution of 1789 to 1793 brought the conflict between bourgeois and aristocrat to a head, and out of that contest, the supremacy of capitalism was hastened and assured by the shattering of feudal restrictions to free competition, to the development of manufacturing, to the right to exploit both labor and partitioned lands. It relieved the bourgeoisie of the burdens of intolerable tithes and discriminatory taxation and permitted the realization of the bourgeoisie's dream of a French nation-state. However, vast as these changes were, the French Revolution meant the triumph of one propertied class over another propertied class. By contrast, the Russian Revolution witnessed for the first time the economic and political expropriation of property-owning classes by a propertyless working class. B. The French bourgeoisie had established its economic and political beachheads within the old regime long before the call for the estates general. Quote, creeping capitalism, end quote, was an irrepressible fact of life throughout the reign of Louis XVI. Bolshevism, on the other hand, could not establish any beachheads under czarism, nor could socialism assert its authority within the framework of American capitalism in the future. For, under socialism, the individual worker remains propertyless, but his class becomes the owner of the means of production through its political control of the state. It is patently impossible, then, for socialism to grow within capitalism since the working class cannot win political control of a nationalized industry in this or that sector of a capitalist economy. If one accepts just these obvious differences between the two revolutions, the whole elegant structure of Deutscherism begins to sag since one of its major underpinnings, his use of the analogy of bourgeois and socialist revolutions, turns out to be a numbing hallucination. There can be no curious sort of merging of Jacobinism, Thermidorianism, Bonapartism, or their alleged, quote, counterparts, end quote, in a socialist society. When Bonaparte deprived the bourgeoisie of many of its political rights, he nevertheless contributed enormously to the consolidation of capitalism, and that he continued to battle the remnants of feudalism, created more congenial conditions for the expansion of capital, 
and in his wars of conquest performed similar services in foreign lands, bringing them into greater harmony with the needs of French capitalism. But as Deutscher's use of the analogy suggests, he could... How could a socialist Bonaparte or a semi-socialist semi-Bonaparte deprive the working class of its political power and at the same time perform services for that class comparable to what Napoleon did for the French ruling class when the working class can be the ruling class only if it has political power? Deprive the workers of political power and they are once again an economically exploited class. C. The French Revolution, as with all bourgeois revolutions, was fought and won primarily by classes alien to the bourgeoisie. What there was of a French bourgeoisie was weak and vacillating, though for a brief period sections of the Third State did develop a messianic vision and fanaticism in the course of their struggle against the nobility. Left to their own resources, however, their triumph would have been much longer in coming. To break the back of the aristocracy... The bourgeoisie was obliged to form temporary and uneasy alliances with elements it feared and upon whom it would turn in fury. The necessary violence with which the aristocracy was defeated within France and the armies raised to resist foreign invasion in defense of the bourgeois revolution were primarily the achievements of the revolutionary Jacobin left, whose mass base was largely found among these, those insurrectionary plebeian elements who had, for less, who had far less to gain than the bourgeois class in whose historic interests they fought. Indeed, in the years immediately following the fall of Robespierre, with the victory of the revolution more or less secure, the Jacobin left and its plebeian supporters were subjected to a white terror at the hands of conservative bourgeois and aristocrats in tacit alliance that f far outdid the violence of Robespierre's Committee of Public Safety. The contrast sharply, this contrasts sharply with a socialist revolution, which can be fought, won, and sustained only by the working class and its natural allies, nor or not at all. The armies of socialism cannot possibly be recruited from the bourgeoisie, while the armies of the bourgeois revolution had to be plebeian in composition. D. The decisive function of politics in a socialist society and the above-noted necessity for the self-mobilization of the oppressed implies a fourth difference between socialist and bourgeois revolution. The role of consciousness, the chief power, the working class must be to me to achieve power. The working class must be moved by an awareness that is on a qualitatively higher plane than that required of a bourgeois class, which had the economic leverage of expanding capitalist enclaves within the old feudal order. And the organized leadership of a socialist working class must be moved by an ideology that is clear, consistent with its objectives sensitive to the needs of the working class and whose aims are never hidden from the people. On the other hand, the social rule of the capitalist class is not dependent on a comparable, sustained, high level of class consciousness. Deutscher would rather not dwell on the importance of consciousness as a socialist criterion since he is anxious to pass Russia off as a form of socialism at the same time as he recognizes the absence of popular direction of Russian society and is repeatedly asserted that the people are lacking in class consciousness and must relearn the habits of political thinking. E. The success of bourgeois revolution is not contingent on the support of the majority of people. A bourgeois government represents the interests of a minority class which may or may not have majority support. A socialist revolution, on the other hand, must have the support of the majority of urban and agrarian wage earners or feel assured of such support in the course of a struggle for power. Napoleon could force bourgeois change down the throat of European society, with bayonets, socialist revolutions and socialist societies cannot impose socialist systems on a hostile majority, either at home or abroad with tanks, bayonets, and armies, as Deutscher tells us Stalin did in Russia and Eastern Europe. 
Where Deutscher does point to dissimilarities between the French and Russian revolutions, they are seldom the basic ones, and more damaging, they are often used to demonstrate either implicitly or explicitly the social superiority of Stalin as against Robespierre, or, excuse me, Robespierre, and of Stalinism against the French Thermidor. An example from The Prophet Outcast, quote, Another difference is even more important. Thermidor brought to a close the revolutionary transformation of French society and the upheaval in property. In the Soviet Union, this, these did not come to a halt with Stalin's ascendancy. On the contrary, the most violent upheaval, collectivization of farming, was carried out under his rule. And it was surely not, quote, law and order, end quote, even in a most anti-popular form that prevailed either in 1923 or at any time during the Stalin era. What the early 1920s had in common with the Thermidorian period was the ebbing away of popular revolutionary energies and the disillusionment and apathy of the masses. It was against such a background that Robespierre had sought to keep the rump of the Jacobin party in power and failed, and that Stalin struggled to preserve the dictatorship of the Bolshevik rump, i.e. of his own faction, and succeeded, end quote. First of all, the Thermidor did not bring to a close the revolutionary transformation of French society. It only brought to a close the Jacobin chapter in that transformation. In fact, the victory of the Thermidorians over the Robespierres assured the continuation of the basic social economic changes in France. While the Robespierreists were committed to bourgeois property rights, they also advocated democratic political and economic policies, such as universal suffrage and price ceilings, which galled the more conservative bourgeois elements, many of whom fell under the guillotine of Robespierre's, quote, reign of terror, end quote. In bringing Robespierre to account after Thermidor, the bourgeoisie rejoiced not because the revolutionary transformation of French society and the, quote, upheaval in property, end quote, ground to a halt, but because the bourgeois upheaval in property would be less constrained by restrictions imposed by the plebeian-based left wing of the revolution. In this decisive sense, the Thermidorians, despite their lessened vigilance vis-a-vis -vis the aristocracy, were the continuance and consolidators of that revolution and those upheavals destined to establish the supremacy of bourgeois property relations. Let me get a drink real quick. Water. By placing a period to the French upheavals in property after Robespierre's fall and, imp and by implicitly and falsely equating the essence of the Russian Revolution with such upheavals as, quote, collectivization of farming, end quote, Stalin and Stalinism emerge as superior creatures, even if admittedly somewhat odious. In Dorcher's analogous heap, Stalin, quote, succeeded where Robespierre failed, and Stalin carried out revolutionary upheavals where the Thermidorians supposedly brought them to a halt. Shortly after this revealing comparison, Deutscher gives forth in the same intellectual spirit with both a similarity and a difference between Stalin and Robespierre. Quote, The historically far more justified charge that Trotsky could have leveled against Stalin, i.e. that Stalinism represented the Russian Thermidor, was that he instituted a reign of terror like Robespierre's, and that he had monstrously outdone Robespierre. That Stalin monstrously outdid Robespierre in the use of terror will be challenged by no responsible person. The, that Stalin's reign of terror was anything like, quote, like Robespierre's, end quote, is to monstrously abuse Robespierre and history. There has been a tendency, perhaps, for socialists to overdress Robespierre to revolutionary democratic robes, to glamorize the man and the faction he led. 
Robespierre's terror was not only directed against the aristocracy and the, the Gironde. It moved against his opposition on the left, Hébert and the Enrage, using false accusations, drumhead trials, and the guillotine in a violent and futile effort to consolidate Robespierre's power. Despite the similarities, to place Robespierre's terror in a, quote, like category with Stalin's terror is somewhat like comparing a gourmand or gourmand to a cannibal. I don't know what a gourmand is. A gourmand to a cannibal because both are meat eaters. The fact is that the brunt of the French terror was felt by the aristocracy, by those who speculated in the welfare of the people, by bourgeois elements who grew to fear the sans culette or saint culotte more than the nobility, and by those... Oh, excuse me. You know what? I should actually look this up real quick. Sorry. I can hear people crying out. Pausing. How can you do this? How can you do this, you monster? Sans culotte. Sans culotte. Sans culotte. The fact is that the brunt of the French terror was felt by the aristocracy, by those who speculated in the welfare of the people, by bourgeois elements who grew to fear the sans culot more than the nobility, and by those who gave aid and comfort to foreign armies fighting on French soil. Now, if Stalin's terror was, quote, like Robespierre's, only more thorough, then it would seem that Stalin's terror was primarily and more effectively directed against comparable elements in Russia, against czarist restorationists, agents of foreign imperialism, swindlers, etc. But this was not the case, of course. Stalin's terror was directed against, the worker, against workers, peasants, intellectuals, socialists, as well as against the top and secondary leadership and tens of thousands of rank-and-file members of the Communist Party. How is this like Robespierre's terror? Apologia for Forced Industrialization Deutscher does believe in democracy, and he does look forward to socialist democracy in Russia. At least he has so assured us in his writings. But when it comes down to the here and now, and who one should support, which system is progressive, democracy becomes a secondary consideration, and in any conflict between democracy and what he believes to be the needs of industrialization in a nationalized and collectivized economy, the former is denied any decisive merit. This is borne out above all in Deutscher's treatment of, quote, primitive socialist accumulation, end quote, in which his value judgments are evident. The Russian economy, weak to begin with in 1914, was shattered by more than seven years of war and revolution. The defeat of the revolution in the West was an even heavier blow to the industrial needs of the Soviet regime. Confronted with famine, apathy, and mounting hostility, the Leninist Party led the country into the new economic policy period, which was highlighted by a general relaxation of economic controls. Forced grain collections were eliminated, and the market in the agrarian sector of the economy was reintroduced to encourage the farmer to produce. This served to stabilize Russian society. Anti-government violence subsided in the countryside. More food was produced by the profit-motivated farm and... F excuse me. This served to stabilize Russian society. Anti-government violence subsided in the countryside. More food was produced by the profit-motivated farmer, and famine was thereby averted among urban consumers. The blessings of the new economic policy, however, were short of short duration and never unmixed. 
It was initiated by an already bureaucratized party that counterweighted economic relaxation with still tighter party political controls. With the declining caliber of the party and Stalin's ascendancy, it served the latter's purposes to give the new economic policy, originally designed as a temporary stopgap, a more permanent place in party ideology. A new class of more prosperous farmers, kulaks, was advised by the Stalin regime to, quote, enrich yourselves, end quote. Well, usually, I think that quote to enrich yourselves is uh, actually from Bukharin. And I'm not sure if Bukharin and Stalin are in alignment at this period. They go into alignment and out of alignment. Um, to my understanding, there's a very good article by... Um, fuck is that guy's name? This thing is John... Eric Merritt, I mean, the last name is Merritt, but it's about how, it's about the debates within the Communist Party in Russia in the 20s about how to proceed with uh, development, and he argues that the only um, solution that provided a democratic, socialist democratic option was that... um, carried by the so-called right opposition um, around Bukharin, which wanted to uh, extend the new economic policy into the future, as opposed to engaging in some kind of um, breakneck industrialization project, which I believe that Trotsky was the advocate of, but people would dispute that. People say, you know, there's like this, I think there's a paper called like the myth of the super-industrializer, but there's no indication that tempor- that Trotsky, or maybe there was indication, I don't know. It's debated whether there's indication about whether Trotsky would have um, approved of such terroristic measures in the Soviet Union um, to the peasantry in this period, as well as like the extreme exploitation of the working classes in the industrial sections and the mass use of uh, slave labor. Um, it's, I don't think uh, there's a. Uh, some people, uh, people would argue that tro- that was not something that Trotsky was in favor of, and I think, um, I think this author would not uh, would not think that Trotsky was in agreement with that. But it seems like also it's like well, you know, in spite of itself, in spite of itself, the forced industrialization was progressive. I think that's at least like one form of Trotskyism, which I think is what um, Julius Jacobson is uh, disputing here. You know, like I think that's what he's saying about Isaac. I think he's saying that that's what Isaac Deutscher's position is, but <laughs> while still claiming um, Trotsky's credentials. But I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm just rambling on, but I'm kind of thinking out loud. Anyway, the last thing I said was a new class of more prosperous farmers, kulaks, was advised by the Stalin regime to, quote, enrich yourselves, end quote. This, of course, they tried to do, one technique being to withhold produce from the once again hard-pressed urban consumers in the late 20s. The farmers sought not only to keep the price of their produce at a profitable level, but were incensed over the prospect of their profits being wiped out by the rising price of urban manufactured goods produced by an inefficient and neglected Russian industry. By 1929, Stalin was confronted by a hungry proletariat, a weak industry, an insurrectionary peasantry, and a rising class of capitalist-oriented kulaks. Stalin set about to strengthen the Communist Party and his position in it with a radical and sudden departure from the policies of 1923-29, to This was to be the period of forced collectivization and forced industrialization. These objectives could be achieved by Stalin in only one way, through the most massive, systematized, historically unrivaled application of mass terror. Forced collectivization required a veritable civil war in which millions of peasants were killed by gunfire, famine, and the rigors of labor camps. Industrialization was advanced in similar fashion. The political auxiliary of these new economic policies was the consolidation of totalitarianism, one-man dictatorship, and mass purges. 
The human misery wrought by Stalinist industrialization and collectivization is detailed by Isaac Deutscher. But for all his lamentations over Stalin's barbarities, Deutscher's final political judgment is essentially indifferent to totalitarianism's, totalitarianism's deprivation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In his balance sheet of history, forced collectivization and industrialization are in the historical black, so to speak. Since, Stalin's pre since Stalin preserved and extended the, quote, socialist, end quote, nature of the economy, it was Russia's, quote, second revolution, end quote, which we are told could only be carried out brutally and require the extirpation of democracy um, in, the hist in the historiography of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, the second revolution is often referred to as uh, Stalin's revolution from above. The logic of Deutscherism is inescapable. Given his views of socialism, which eliminate democracy as an integral part of socialism, and given his conviction that only the inevitably, quote, predetermined, end quote, evolved system of Stalinism could bring this good about, there is no ground for repudiating Stalin's methods other than an irrelevant squeamishness. Perhaps it was not necessary to slander the old Bolsheviks with the charge of being agents of foreign imperialism and on Hitler's payroll, but whatever reasons might be advanced, from Deutscher's point of view and analysis, if logic prevails, the old Bolsheviks had to be removed one way or another since it can easily be established that their very existence was a serious menace to the consolidation of Stalinism politically and therefore an impediment to its historic, quote, socialist, end quote, mission of raising Russia from the wooden plow to the tractor. More generally, Deutscher has created a theoretical justification for terror whose practical significance today lies in its contribution to totalitarian tendencies which seek, on similar grounds, to justify the use of terror and the liquidation of democracy in Democrats in Cuba, China, North Vietnam, and elsewhere on the ground that such terror is historically conditioned and necessary for the sake of social progress. A basic merit of industrialization in Deutscher's view is that it provided the economic catalyst for Russia's evolution from authoritarian socialism. This optimistic vision is presented in Marxist, Marxistical terms, although, that, um, although what emerges is a crude form of economic determinism that shares nothing with Marxism. In the Marxist view, Political institutions, philosophical ideas, legal concepts, national customs, and habits are shaped and influenced by the material conditions of life. These material factors include a. All the limitations and propensities inherent in natural conditions, climate, waterways, topography, etc. And b. The level and form of economic activity. Since the conditions of nature are relatively constant, it is to the variable factor economic conditions that the historian must turn to understand the complexities of social revolution excuse me of social evolution the changes in the level of productivity the means whereby the product is exchanged the economic relations into which men are obliged to enter with other men becoming the underlying sources of social transformation marxism did not limit itself to promulgating a philosophical view of the world it sought to examine concretely the economic relations men entered into with one another, to establish the causes and consequences of economic conflict, to learn what is needed to permit man to overcome the limitations of nature. In this class struggle, Marxists found the, quote, locomotive of history, end quote. In the capitalist mode of production, they found inner contradictions, which would lead to the expropriation of capitalist expropriators. And in the growth of the productive forces, Marxism saw the prerequisite of man's emancipation from exploitative class society. In, it is in this latter condition for freedom, the growth of productive forces, that the modern authoritarian socialist finds it possible to mask economic determinism with a protective Marxist cloak. Did not Marx find that capitalism, as against feudalism, was a progressive form of society, because it meant a vast growth of the productive forces. And if capitalism was a historic advance because it meant the triumph of the machine process over feudal agrarianism, 
is not Stalinism a progressive form of, so of society because in Russia it transformed an agrarian economy into a highly industrialized one and created a large industrial working class. In the words of the Dean of Authoritarian Socialism, end quote, excuse me, in the, in the words of the Dean of Authoritarian Socialism, quote, <laughs> in spite of its, quote, blood and dirt, the English Industrial Revolution, Marx did not dispute this, marked a tremendous progress in the history of mankind. It opened a new and not unhopeful epoch of civilization. Stalin's Industrial Revolution can claim the same merit, end quote. There was so much wrong with this analogy between Stalinist industrialization in modern times and the growth of the factory system more than a century ago that we must limit ourselves here to itemizing a few critical observations. A. The victory of capitalism was achieved at the expense of a retrograde feudal society. The victory of Stalinism had its precondition the defeat of a socialistic Russia. B. For all its hesitations and misgivings about democracy, for all its violence against the working class, even in its earliest days, the victory of the European bourgeoisie was over the nobility, witnessed an extension of individual rights and political freedom, which is unthinkable under feudalism. And what the bourgeoisie would not willingly concede to the nation in the way of democracy could often be won by democratic forces within the framework of the bourgeois social order. What is disastrous for Deutscher's analogy of capitalist and Stalinist industrialization is that Stalinist industrialization was affected under the auspices of a totalitarian force which can remain in power only as long as it can prevent the emergence of democratic institutions. C. One progressive contribution of capitalism was the creation of a large socially homogenous industrial proletariat, which is, in the Marxist view, the indispensable agent for liberating society. This class unique to capitalist society, quote, was freed, end quote, from any ownership of the means of production, but it was, of necessity, also freed from the political servitude of feudalism. This political freedom is atypical of Stalinism's working class and would be inimical to its totalitarian collectivized economy. The Russian working class is not the same as the industrial proletariat described by Marx. D. To increase the wealth of nations, there was no alternative to a capitalist reorganization of society. The economic basis of socialism had to be developed, and a working class of weight and experience had to appear. It was yet to be proved that despite the degree of Russia's economic backwardness, and given the economically advanced character of the capitalist world, the only way to modernize Russia was through its Stalinization. Moreover, Stalinization in Russia cannot be considered in isolation. Stalinization in Russia meant the corruption of the world communists' movement, reducing foreign parties to little more than adjuncts of the Kremlin. It meant sacrificing socialist principles and national revolutionary ambitions throughout the world for the sake of securing the degenerated Russian Communist Party in power. Before dismissing the possibility of Russia industrializing in a democratic manner, one must consider the very real possibility that a genuinely communist, i.e. revolutionary socialist movement in Germany, might have taken power in 1932 which would have changed the political map of Europe and provided the technological assistance for which the Bolshevik leaders of 1917 thirsted. That seems a little extremely optimistic about the German Communist Party in the early 1930s. <clears throat> well, he says a genuinely communist, i.e. revolutionary movement. Okay, he's not saying... Revolutionary actions of the Communist Party. Sorry, I'm uh, misunderstanding. E. The most telling difference between Marx's treatment of England's Industrial Revolution and Deutscher's view of Stalinist industrialization is the following. <clears throat> 
Marx never used his view of capitalist industri industrialization to underplay the attendant horrors of British exploitation on the ground that England's economic growth was largely contingent on the sun never setting on its empire. In Deutscher's hands, by contrast, the alleged progressiveness of an industrializing, nationalized economy is used to cloud reality and to cast Stalinist imperialism, imperialism in a progressive mold. But, it is said, forced industrialization is a thing of the past. And even if it was a nasty business, look at how it has transformed Russia and improved the living standards of the Russian people today. However, even where these highly touted economic advances are concerned, we are less impressed than Isaac Deutscher and the whole coterie of Stalinoid aficionados of the statistics of the statistic whose spirits soar with every new orbiting Sputnik or rise in the production of steel or pigs. The growth is certainly real, but the important thing for socialists, apart from the question of who controls the expanding economy, is to know who are its beneficiaries. One thing is certain, those, mass, those benefiting least are the workers and peasants. The truth of the matter is that by American standards, the vast majority of Russian wage earners would qualify for assistance under the Washington administration's anti-poverty program and be eligible for supplementary relief from local welfare agencies. In February of this year, the USSR's Central Statistical Administration, reporting on the final year's achievement of the seven-year plan, 1959 to 65, stated that the, quote, average monthly earnings of workers and employees in the national economy increased from 90 rubles in 1964 to 95 rubles in 1965, or by 5.8%, end quote. The higher figure means an average weekly wage of approximately $25 on the basis of the dollar-ruble exchange rate. What about the many fringe benefits that Russian workers are said to receive? The following figures given in the report re reveal how modest they really are. Quote, if the payments and benefits received from public funds are added in, the average earnings increased correspondingly from 121 rubles in 1964, to 128 rubles per month in 1965, end quote. Even if these figures are not exaggerated, the combined wage and public fund benefits would come to $33 per week, or slightly over $1,700 a year. What does the five-year plan nineteen sixty six to nineteen seventy recently adopted at the party's twenty third Congress hold in store for the workers in Deutscher Socialist Russia. I'll be in dinner time. Primary Kosigan's report to the Congress on the five year plan directives let us know quote the average monthly wages of production and office workers will go up during the five years by an average of not less than twenty percent and by the end of the new five-year plan will amount to about 115 rubles. If payments and benefits from the public consumption funds are included, the total will reach approximately 155 rubles per employed person, end quote. In other words, after another five years of reaping socialism, the average working man can look forward to a total income from pay and benefits of around $40 per week. And these figures are for urban, industrial, and white-collar workers. If we averaged in agricultural earnings, the figures would be still lower. While this will be the average income if the goal is fulfilled, whole categories of workers will receive considerably less. According to the section of the five-year plan concerned with, quote, raised, raising the material well-being and cultural level of the people, end quote, we are informed of the party's ambition, quote, to raise the minimum wage in the national economy to 60 rubles a month, end quote, $16 a week by 1970. As this is to be the minimum wage if the plan is successfully completed, it is reasonable enough to assume, and there are statistics to bear it out, that today there are categories of unskilled workers who receive no more than $13 to $14 a week. How much culture and well-being can be raised on this pittance? While there has been some leveling of income in Russia, it is nonetheless the case that in Deutscher's socialist economy, there are, talk, 
top academicians and administrators who receive up to $10,000 a year, apart from such little extras as DACAs, which are like houses, or like, um, I usually think of, they're like country houses, I think, but let me, let me just look it up real quick. Might just be a house, but I think it's kind of like a luxury house. Yeah, they're like country houses. A DACA is a seasonal or year-round second home, often located in the exurbs of post-Soviet countries, including Russia. Yeah, so. I was right. It's like a getaway home. Um, where am I? While there has been some leveling of income in Russia, it is nonetheless the case that in Deutsch's socialist economy, there are top academicians and administrators who receive up to $10,000 a year, apart from such little extras as DACAs and chauffeured limousines. Between high and low earnings, then, there is a differential of 14 to 1, compared to a spread of 5 to 1 in equivalent categories in Western bourgeois countries. In Russia, there is an income tax. It is not high by American standards, but high enough given the low wages. It begins with incomes of only 60 rubles a month and discriminates against the poor since it is not a highly graduated direct tax system. Instead, a family of four earning 50 rubles above the 60 ruble exemption pays 10% of those 50 rubles, while a top administrator who earns 80%, excuse me, 800 rubles above the 60 only pays 13% in taxes. A continuing major source of revenue is the turnover tax, which continues to add about 30% to retail prices. This too discriminates against the poor who must pay the same 30% on the price of goods as the affluent professional or bureaucrat. The situation for Russian worker consumers is even more morbid than the above figures suggest, since the prices they must pay for basic necessities of life are outlandish. The price of butter and meals excuse me. The price of butter and meats were raised twenty five to thirty per cent in nineteen sixty two. The increases have not been rescinded. A pound of salted butter costs one dollar and seventy five cents in Moscow, and the average buyer must work well over three hours in, to earn enough for the purchase. In, Mo in New York, the comparable figures of 75 cents a pound and 19 minutes work time for the average factory worker. The price of beef is approximately the same in Moscow and New York, but the Moscow worker must work five times as long as his New York counterpart to make the purchase. The story is the same for such items as sugar, bread, potatoes, eggs, and milk, where the Muscovite must work from 400% to 1,900% longer than the New Yorker to purchase these necessities. It is the same in clothing, where, for example, an average Russian worker must be prepared to spend five weeks' pay for a suit of moderate quality that would require 23 hours' work time for a New York worker. Mo other Moscow figures, four weeks' work for a radio set, two months for a TV set, while well, even the lowest priced car is for bureaucrats only since it would require three to four years of work time. The statistics on food costs are based on state fixed prices. However, since there is continuing shortage is a continuing shortage of these basic goods, the consumer is often obliged to buy on the open market where farmers sell their goods for considerably higher prices. It is true that on the positive side of the economic picture are the considerably lower rents in Russia compared to the United States. On the other hand, the Russian family gets considerably less for its money. Russian dwellings are notoriously inadequate in quality and terribly overcrowded with a total floor space per person of 100 square feet, 10 foot by 10 foot, including kitchen and bathroom. Compare these economic facts of Russian life with Deutscher's, quote, certainly, end quote. Compare, excuse me. Compare these economic, I think there might be a typo here, I'm not sure, I'm just going to read it straight, is what it says. Compare these economic facts of Russian life with Deutscher's, 
quote, certainly, end quote, of surpassing Western European standards by 1969, and consider the moral enormity of a view that considers Russia to be reaping the benefits of socialism as far back as 1959. Apologia for Imperialism Deutscher's obscuring of the full scope and criminality of Stalinist industrialization is matched by his pretension, excuse me, his presentation of Russia's post-war conquest of Eastern Europe as if it were merely a distorted and unsophisticated application of the Marxist concept of the socialist revolution in permanence. In his introduction to the Age of Permanent Revolution, a Trotsky anthology published less than two years ago, he found that just as Stalin was the manager of the ideas and domestic affairs developed by the man he murdered, so was he the executor of Trotsky's will to world socialist revolution. Quote, dot, 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 his, Stalin's, single country socialism was indeed, as Trotsky maintained, a pragmatist utopia. The Soviet Union abandoned it to all intents and purposes towards the end of the Second World War, when its tanks, in pursuit of Hitler's armies, marched into a dozen foreign lands and carried revolution on their bayonets and in the turrets of their tanks. End quote. This socialism by foreign tanks and bayonets is one of Deutscher's pet themes that deserves a more detailed view. In discussing the Battle of Vistula, which witnessed the decisive defeat of the Red Armies at the gates of Warsaw in 1920, Deutscher wrote in The Prophet Armed that the battle, quote, did not change the course of history as its contemporaries believed. It only delayed it by a quarter of a century, end quote. In other words, Stalin succeeded in Poland where Trotsky and Lenin failed a quarter of a century earlier, exclamation point. Of course, as Deutscher knows and acknowledges, the earlier Russian invasion of Poland took place under entirely different circumstances and with altogether different motives than Stalin's military conquests. In 1920, the Red Army invaded Poland as a continuation of a war which had begun as a defensive operation. Large sections of the Ukraine had already been occupied by Polish troops who amused themselves by inflicting all sorts of atrocities upon the Ukrainian people. The enmity of the Ukrainian peasant to Pilsudski's troops facilitated the Bolshevik military victory in the Ukraine, and when the Red Army reached Polish borders, it pursued the retreating Polish armies into Poland proper. This military venture, however, was undertaken against the advice of Trotsky, who did not believe that Russian bayonets were a proper substitute for an absent socialist consciousness of the Polish people. Lenin and the majority of the Bolsheviks did order the continuation of the war into Polish territory, but even for them, a victorious Red Army was not intended as an occupying force to stuff freedom down Polish throats with Russian bayonets. They were convinced that the Polish people would respond favorably to the Red Army, and perhaps at an even greater consideration for the Bolshevik majority with its conviction that a Red Army on the Polish-German border would provide a moral and political impetus to the developing revolutionary consciousness of the German working class. In any case, the 1920 Polish adventure came to be looked on by Lenin and his party as a mistake for precisely those reasons advanced by Trotsky at the time of his minority opposition to the war. Socialism cannot be advanced in foreign countries on the points of bayonets. By contrast, the Russian occupation of Poland in 1945 did not follow the expulsion of Polish troops from Russian soil. The fate of the Polish armies had been sealed five years earlier in the aftermath of the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939, and Stalin's conquest of Poland had nothing to do with an anticipated rise of Polish socialist consciousness, and nothing to do with providing the catalyst for a revolutionary upheaval from below of the Western European working class. Deutscher is actually aware of how removed his concept of socialism by foreign bayonets is from revolutionary socialist principles. He has written, for example, that, quote, it had been a canon of Marxist political, sorry, me, a canon of Marxist politics that revolution cannot and must not be carried on the point of bayonets into foreign countries, end quote. And that this canon, quote, 
also followed from the fundamental attitude of Marxism, which looked to the working classes of all nations as to the sovereign agents of socialism and certainly did not expect socialism to be imposed upon peoples from outside, end quote. Deutscher, with his foreign, quote, socialist, end quote, bayonets, is privileged to violate what he recognizes to be fundamental Marxist attitudes, but he has no right to do so and simultaneously pose as a Marxist. What term other than imperialism can more accurately describe the foreign politics of a country which by the use or threat of armed force imposes its will and at times its social system on weaker nations? This imperialism may not be generated by the economic drives peculiar to monopoly capitalism, but imperialism generally defined is not unique to capitalism. Caesar's marauding imperial legions were not driven by a need to offset a falling rate of profit. Russia is a modern case in point of a non-capitalist imperialism. It was not impelled to export capital to post-war Europe. It, was, it merely exported its social system at bayonet point. Deutscher frequently waxes wroth over the manner and consequences of Russian, quote, expansionism, end quote. But he is incapable of presenting a clear, consistent repudiation of this imperialism given his view that the Kremlin was exporting revolutionary progress with some unsavory practices. Even his criticisms of communist methods often prove to be disarming preludes to contradictory political conclusions rationalizing some of the, crude, rationalizing some of the cruder aspects of Stalinist imperialism. In his Stalin, where we find the most explicit and detailed apologetics, he wrote, quote, Between the two wars, World War I and II, nearly all those people of Eastern Europe had been standed, stranded in an impasse. Their life had been bogged down in savage poverty and darkness. Their politics had been dominated by archaic cliques who had not minded the material and cultural retrogression of their subjects as long as their own privileges had been safe. The whole portion of Europe had emerged from the Second World War and from the hideous, quote, school of Nazism, even more destitute, savage, and helpless, end quote. This grim, deepening, excuse me, this grim sweeping canvas of Eastern Europe is drawn in somewhat exaggerated strokes, particularly if one includes Czechoslovakia. But there is method in Deutscher's leveling post-war post Eastern Europe to one pathetic, helpless, savage mass. He is actually preparing us for East Europe's post-war liberation by Stalin. He's actually preparing us for East Wars, Eastern Europe's post-war liberation by Stalin, who apparently was not a savage, by the Russian Communist Party, which we all know was neither a clique nor archaic, by Russia, which had so firmly established itself as a culturally enlightened nation. Exclamation point. Those are all sarcastic, obviously. In his words, following his chilling image of pre-Stalinist East European barbarism, quote, It may well be that for its peoples the only chance of breaking out of their impasse lay in a coup de force, such as that to which Stalin guarded them, end quote. Apart from the suggestion that Stalinist conquest of Eastern Europe, with its executions, purges, deportations, and overall savagery, provided the, quote, only chance, end quote, for freedom, there is the insidious suggestion that communist regimes were not actually installed by the Kremlin, but by Czechs, Poles, Hungarians, etc., merely spurred on by Stalin. Moved by his own rhetoric, perhaps, Deutscher next reveals more of his hand. Quote, in Poland and Hungary, the communist-inspired land reform fulfilled, perhaps imperfectly, a dream of many generations of peasants and intellectuals. All over Eastern Europe, the communists, having nationalized the main industries, vigorously promoted plans for industrialization and full employment, such as were beyond the material resources and wit of native, quote, private enterprise, end quote, dot, 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 end quote. The new people's democracies, quote, did much to calm nationalist vendettas and to promote cooperation between their people. In a word, they opened before Eastern Europe broad vistas of common reform and advancement. It was as if, as if Russia had imparted to her neighbors some of her own ways and methods of communal work and social organization. Considering the vastness and radical character of the upheaval, it is remarkable that Stalin and his men brought it off not without terror indeed, not without indulging in a long series of coups, 
but without provoking within the Russian orbit a real civil war such as that waged in Greece, end quote. Thus Deutscher's vision. Ours is somewhat less euphoric. In Russia's post-war aggrandizement, we see armies of occupation, the threat and use of force, trumped-up elections, mounted hatred by peasants, workers, intellectuals, political suppression, bureaucratic inefficiency in industry, low living standards, national indignities. We also see the mass graves of Hungarian revolutionaries, workers, peasants, intellectuals, children who chose the path of armed resistance since they could nowhere find on totalitarianism's political map the, quote, broad vistas of common reform and advancement, end quote, conjured up by Deutscher. To soften the imperial edge of Russia's foreign policy, Deutscher has offered some extraordinary explanations for Russian expansionism, including the theory that Stalin imposed communist satellite regimes on Eastern Europe virtually against his will. In discussing the Tehran, Yalta, and Potsdam agreements, Deutscher in his Russia What Next wrote, quote, It may, of course be argued that Stalin's behavior during the war was nothing but make-believe, and that all his solemn vows of non-interference in the internal affairs of neighboring countries were dust thrown into the eye of his allies. On the other hand, Stalin's deeds at the time lent weight to his vows, dot, dot, dot. The point is that both Churchill and Roosevelt had solid evidence that Stalin's policy was, in fact, geared to self-containment. They saw Stalin acting, not merely speaking, as any nationalist statesman would have done in his place. They saw him divested, as it were, of his communist character. He was approaching the problems of the Russian zone of influence in a manner calculated to satisfy nationalist Russian demands and aspirations and to wreck the chances of communist revolution in those territories, end quote. If we believe Deutscher, Stalin was committed to a policy of Russian self-containment and shrank from the prospect of imposing communist regimes in Eastern and Central Europe. What kind of governments did Stalin want in Eastern and Central Europe? Bourgeois governments. At least so Deutscher tells us. Quote, he, Stalin, expected, of course, that, the, that victorious Russia would enjoy a position of diplomatic and economic preponderance in neighboring countries ruled by, quote, friendly governments, end quote, to quote the insipid cliché then fashionable, but he also expected that those governments would remain essentially bourgeois, end quote. If Stalin preferred friendly bourgeois governments, why did he impose communist regimes on Eastern Europe? Deutscher is quick to answer, quote, dot, 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 at least three factors combined to undo Stalin's policy of self-containment, genuine revolutionary ferment abroad, the revolutionary urge in Stalin's own armies, and the jockeying for position among allies rapidly turning into potential enemies, end quote. The first of Deutscher's three factors is patently false. Since the regimes the Kremlin imposed on Central and Eastern Europe could in no sense have been a response, either positive or negative, to internal communist ferment. In Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, etc., communist parties existed in varying degrees of strength, but in no case, except Yugoslavia, were these parties in a position to take power relying solely upon their own resources. It is Deutscher himself who wrote, as we have quoted above, that Eastern Europe had emerged from the war and from the hideous school of Nazism, quote, even more destitute, savage, and helpless, end quote, than before the war. By what dialectical contortion is it possible to find, at the same time and the same place, both a state of barbarism and helplessness and a state of, quote, genuine revolutionary ferment, end quote. The contradiction is too apparent to dwell upon. The only consistent element is that Deutscher uses each part of his contradiction for the same purpose of rationalizing Russian imperialism. <laughs> 
The second reason offered for Stalin's abandoning his alleged non-imperialist policy of self-containment, that it was a response to a global revolutionary urge welling up in the ideological breast of Russian army personnel, is even less serious than the first. It is incredible to think that if Stalin really wanted to maintain capitalism in Eastern Europe after the war, he would succumb on such a decisive matter to the allegedly internationalist communist aspirations of army officers. If these idealistic communist generals could passively abide Stalin's murderous purge of the armed forces in the 1930s and then swallow the Nazi-Soviet pact, is it conceivable that they would be in a mutinous frame of mind by Stalin's supposed policy of self-containment. The third reason, given, that Russia abandoned its pre-war policy of self-containment because former wartime allies were becoming potential enemies, has merit. But this in, is in no way, but this in no way reduces the fact and culpability of communist imperialism. One can also point to Washington's need for political or strategic defense to explain American intervention in Guatemala, Cuba, and Vietnam that would hardly vindicate Washington or absolve it of the charge of imperialism. Life and politics are complicated enough in the modern world without needlessly adding to them such exotic political motivations as Deutscher claims to find behind Russian expansionism. What the Kremlin successfully sought was to plunder the economies of East Germany, Central and Eastern Europe. It robbed these countries of enormous wealth, called reparations in the case of East Germany, forcibly imported thousands of workers and technicians to help rebuild Russia's war-torn industry, and dictated terms of economic trade most favorable to Russia. Thievery was not Russia's only objective. The Cold War was underway before the smoke of World War II had lifted in Europe and Asia. Only two great and inimical powers emerged from the war, the United States and Russia, and the, Kremlin's, the Kremlin instinctively sought to secure its position, politically and militarily, in Europe. In addition, to achieve its immediate economic, political, and military objectives, Russia was obliged to frustrate, whenever possible, the independent revolutionary potential that inhered in the anti-Nazi resistance movements throughout Europe. Stalin understood that these ambitions and needs could not be met in deals with bourgeois governments, but through the direct annexation of foreign territories or the imposition of Russian-dominated communist regimes, wherever this could be done with some show of plausibility, such as trotting out old czarist claims to parts of Poland and a minimum risk of war with the United States. To believe that Stalin, out of conservatism or a dogmatic allegiance to his theory of socialism in one country, was reluctant to fulfill these imperialist ambitions is to be guilty of misreading history, or of underplaying the venality of Stalinism, or, as in the case of Deutscher, to be guilty of both. A recent example of Deutscher's apologia for Russian imperialism was his performance at the nationally televised teach-in held in Washington, D.C. in May 1965. There, Deutscher rejected the reciprocal responsibility of Washington and Moscow for the Cold War, arguing instead that it was the exclusive initial responsibility of Western imperialism. Evidence offered of Russia's Pacific intentions included his claim that Russian armed forces had been reduced to, quote, less than three million men by the end of 1947, end quote. This is an example of a man shaving a statistic to fit a theory since by the end of 1947, Russia's armed forces were closer to 4 million than 3 million men. But even accepting Deutscher's paired figure, or pared figure, approximately 6% of the adult Russian male population was in the armed forces. The actual figure is closer to 8%, and both figures are considerably higher if computed on the basis of able-bodied men under the age of 60 and further increased if we add the well-equipped armies of secret police and other paramilitary organizations. Considering that this commitment to the forces of destruction was made by a country horribly drained of economic and human resources, we have a better measure of Russia's post-war militarism. And we get a clear image of Deutscher's design when we remember that he conveniently omitted from his picture of Russia's military posture such factual details as the strength of, the Stal of Stalinist armies maintained in subjugated occupied countries, 22 divisions in East Germany, 2 divisions in Poland, 
two in Hungary, two in Romania, troops in Austria, Finland, Port Arthur, and the Baltics, gobbled up in 1940, and other thousands of supply troops in these areas and in Russia to keep the Imperial fighting legions in combat readiness. In the same Washington speech and in the same spirit of apologetics, Deutscher went on to claim that the Kremlin never did, quote, threaten to overturn, overrun Europe. Never did, quote, threaten to overrun Europe, end quote. And, what is more, quote, I don't think that the attack on Stalin's government on the basis, excuse me, quote, I don't think that the attack on Stalin's government on the basis of its alleged threat to peace of the world was ever justified, end quote. One difficulty with the first statement is that Stalin did, in effect, overrun one-third of the continent outside of Russian borders, East Germany, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, the Baltics, and that Stalin had designs on West Germany is part of the historic record. That Russia did not directly threaten the rest of Western Europe does not mean that such fears had no basis in reality. As for his denial that Stalin's government, quote, was ever, end quote, a threat to the peace of the world, it is at such variance with history from the time of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Was this not a threat to world peace? Until Stalin's death, that it is perhaps best to let the remark speak for itself. The Restoration's Bugbear An age-old device of apologists for reaction is to defend what exists, wicked as it is acknowledged to be, lest sudden upheaval bring on something worse. Deutscher is an old hand at the game. Whenever communist imperialism has been threatened by revolution, he admits that life was bad for the people, but it would have been worse if the insurgents won. We, have, we would have had, among other things, bourgeois restoration! Exclamation point. According to the prophet Unarmed, written shortly after the Hungarian Revolution, Deutscher wrote, quote, Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, and Eastern Germany, however, found itself almost on the brink of bourgeois restoration at the end of the Stalin era. Only Soviet armed power or its threats stopped it there, end quote. This is Deutscher, parentheses and all. Earlier in this essay, in a summary of the actual program, objectives, leadership, and conduct of the Hungarian Revolution, we refuted Deutscher's slander against the Hungarian people. Here, let us look at Deutscher's more general bugbear of, quote, bourgeois restoration, a, ho a hoax so untenable that he can do no more than mention it in footnotes and in passing, although the thought is of the greatest theoretical and political significance. Consider some relevant facts about Hungary. There, as in other East European countries, the bourgeoisie was never strong. Much of Hungary was controlled by foreign capital, in part to protect what it could of its industry from its predatory grip of foreign financiers. Excuse me, from this predatory grip of foreign financiers, the pre-war Hungarian governments nationalized a good deal of the native industry, thereby further undercutting the power of Hungarian capitalists. During the war, Hungary was a German ally. As a result, about one-third of Hungarian industry fell into the hands of German capitalists and the Nazi state. Excluding land and buildings, around one-fourth of Hungarian wealth was German-controlled. With Germany's defeat, the power of Hungarian capitalism was further weakened since much of her industry, left ownerless, had to be taken over by the state. Other industries owned by Hungarians who collaborated with the Nazis were also taken over by the state. That Hungary was a German ally became the legal basis for Russia to occupy that country. As conquerors, the Russians proceeded to destroy what was left of the Hungarian bourgeoisie, dismantling, looting, and taking over outright ownership of considerable sections of Hungarian industry. When the Russians installed their puppet communist government, 
the two forces combine to uproot and decisively destroy the residues of capitalism. How can capitalism be restored in Hungary in light of the above? Capitalism requires capitalists. Who are they? Even if they could be brought back from the beyond, how could they divide a nationalized Hungarian industry, much of it built during the past 20 years? Capitalism in Hungary is dead. It is merely Deutscher's Frankenstein created to frighten the unthinking and to shore up his opposition to the Hungarian Revolution. In The Prophet Outcast, Deutscher even tracks down bourgeois elements still operating in Russia itself. It is a discovery pertinent to our discussion of his apologia for Russian imperialism, as can be seen in the first sentence of the following quotation, quote, the Stalinist state, bracket, Russia, end bracket, by promoting or assisting its own reasons, for its own reasons, revolution in Eastern Europe and Asia, created formidable counterchecks to its own bourgeois tendencies. The post-war industrialization, the immense expansion of the Soviet working class, the growth of mass education, and the reviving self-assurance of the workers tended to subdue the bourgeois elements in the state. After Stalin's death, the bureaucracy is compelled to make concessions after concession to the egalitarianism of the masses. To be sure, the tension between the bourgeois and the socialist elements of the state continues, and being inherent in the structure of any post-capitalist society, it was bound to persist for a very long time to come." End quote. After nearly 50 years of revolution, civil war, nationalization, collectivization, industrialization, terror, purges, slave labor camps, deportations, and war to discover bourgeois elements in Russia strong enough to produce tension in their conflict with the, quote, socialist elements of the state, end quote, is no less astounding than if Deutscher had announced that he had unearthed descendants of the lost tribes of Israel, boring from within the Kremlin walls. We assume that Deutscher has more in mind than peasants who prefer to work their own private plots to working on the collective farms or state farms, and that he will not bring up the Liberman plan as an example of bourgeois forces or plots in Russia. One second. Yet 17 years ago, Deutscher wrote on the same subject in an altogether different vein. Quote, Finally, the whole structure of Russian society has undergone a change so profound and so many-sided that it cannot really be reversed. It is possible to imagine a violent reaction of the Russian people itself against the state of siege in which it has been living so long. It is even possible to imagine something like a political restoration, but it is certain that even such a restoration would touch merely the surface of Russian society, and that it would demonstrate its impotence vis-a-vis -vis the work done by the revolution, even more thoroughly than the Stuart and Bourbon restorations had done. For of Stalinist Russia, it is even true, excuse me, it is even truer than of any other revolutionary nation that 20 years have done the work of 20 generations, end quote. Stalin, a political biography. If Deutscher knew before 1949 that capitalism was reduced to impotence, how can he find significant struggles with bourgeois elements after nearly another 20 years of that revolution, which presumably does the work of another 20 generations? It all depends on what Deutscher wants to prove at a particular moment. In the earlier quotation from Stalin, he is trying to demonstrate Stalin and Stalinism's superiority to Hitler and Nazism, 
for which he finds evidence in the permanence with which Stalinism has destroyed capitalism, whereas Nazism proved to be a savage historic interlude that neither fundamentally nor permanently altered the German bourgeois order. In the, re in the more recent quotation, Deutscher reincarnates tension-producing bourgeois forces to show, among other things, the basically progressive feature of Russian expansion in Eastern Europe, since this expansion, he says, has served to, quote, counter-check, end quote, the alleged bourgeois elements in Russia itself. Deutscher, the Bernstein of totalitarianism. The conception of society's democratic evolution through its massive industrial growth is not the original, quote, socialist contribution of Isaac Deutscher or the lesser apologist for totalitarianism. It is reminiscent above all of the revisionist school which first made itself felt as a force in the socialist movement before the turn of the century. Under the tutelage of Edward Bernstein, this school advanced the concept that capitalism would bow peacefully before the requirements of its industrial development, furthered in its natural evolution by reforming pressure from the mass of the people, and finally emerging as a fully-fledged democratic socialist society. When Marx saw industrial growth and concentration of capital sharpening the antagonism between capital and labor, Bernstein saw the opposite tendency— to the growth of, in the growth of vast cartels and the credit system. In Bernstein's estimate, the expansion of the modern corporation entailed the emergence of a new middle class of property-controlling shareholders, which would continue to grow at the expense of the social power of the industrial magnate. This new middle class would be able to adjust itself to the needs of an expanding economy. And, through the continued growth of trust and the liberal use of credit, overcome the anarchy of production and eliminate economic crises. Economic growth and diffusion of wealth via the growth of the trust would encourage the adaptive new middle class to discard the laissez-faire doctrine that government is best which governs least. Government would learn to perform the role of mediator and benevolent regulator of society, and the middle class could permit, might even encourage, the extension of progressive social welfare legislation and political democracy. In the meantime, the working class, through its political parties, trade unions, and cooperative societies, would assert itself as a democratizing influence in, on society as a whole. Revisionism gained considerable strength in the German socialist movement after Engels' death since its predictions of growing prosperity, democratic reform, and peace corresponded to the experience of the past 30 years. After 1871, Germany's industrial indices pointed upward. The 10-year periodic crisis predicted by Marx did not occur. The Social Democratic Party gained many adherents and victories at the polls. Cooperative societies sprouted all over the nation. Democratic and social reforms were, in, were effectuated, and there had been no major European conflict since the Franco-Prussian War. Indeed, the case that Bernstein made for evolutionary socialism was a thousand times stronger than that presented by modern authoritarian, quote, socialists. Bernstein's basic revision of Marxian socialism, similar to Deutscher's, was in his substitution of automatic laws attendant to industrial expansion for the mobilization of the mass of people as the catalyst of social revolution. The working class would not have to emancipate itself. Socialism was free to come from above, although Deutscher pays occasional lip service to the necessity of a developing socialist consciousness of the Russian people as a precondition for democratization of communist society. This schema had its predictable political effect. Since the laws of capitalist development ensured its socialist negation, three laws were not to be interfered with, 
by extremist anti-capitalist activities, and there was no longer the need for a socialist party to wage a revolutionary struggle for political power. The socialist movement, perforce, need only be a responsible movement of reform, and since Germany was the advanced capitalist vanguard of Europe, revisionism, despite the pacifism of its leading personality, prepared the German socialist movement for its chauvinist course a decade later, just as Deutsche Reich revisionism, despite its prediction, predilection for the Marxist idiom, prepares sections of the left-wing world for totalitarian rationalization. In place of the adaptation of a corporate middle class to social progress, the revisionists adapted themselves to bourgeois parliamentary democracy. When, where the Bernsteinites followed their theories through politically to the advantage of capitalism, their modern methodological cousins come to the aid of Stalinism. If Russian totalitarianism is the precursor of socialism, then despite its moral shortcomings, Stalinism must be defended against all comers, be they the forces of Western capitalism or the rebellions of its oppressed. Most striking and damning in the parallel between Bernstein and Deutscher is the consistent application of their respective theories to the point of crass apologetics for the imperialist ambitions of Kaiserism and Communism. In his book Evolutionary Socialism, Bernstein described Germany as a nation, quote, which has indeed carried out and is carrying out its honorable share in the civilizing work of the world, end quote. This civilizing function of German colonialism was spelled out, quote, if we take into account the fact that Germany now imports yearly a considerable amount of colonial produce, we must also say to ourselves that the time may come when it will be desirable to draw at least part of these products from our own colonies. However, speedy socialists may imagine the course of development in Germany towards themselves to be. Yet we cannot be blind to the fact that it will need a considerable time before a whole series of other countries are converted to socialism. But if it is not reprehensible to enjoy the produce of tropical plantations, it cannot be so to cultivate such plantations ourselves. Not the whether, but the how, is here the decisive point. It is ne neither necessary that the occupation of tropical lands by Europeans should injure the natives in their, con in their enjoyment of life, nor has it hitherto usually been the case. Moreover, only a conditional right of the savages to the land occupied by them can be recognized. The higher civilization ultimately can claim a higher right. Not the conquest, but the cultivation of the land gives the historical legal title to its use. End quote. Bernstein's brief for German imperialism is clear and direct. Deutscher's rationalization for Stalinist imperialism, wary and subtle, but the basic similarities are there. In the early period, socialists were cautioned against excessive denunciations of Germany's overseas adventures because her fate was related to the rest of the world, so long as, quote, it will need a considerable amount of time before a whole series of other countries are converted to socialism, end quote. It was neither realistic nor desirable to demand that Germany abandon her imperialist policies. Similarly, today, the distance of Western countries from socialism is used to excuse Russian imperialism. So long as Western powers pursue a colonial policy, socialists have no right to demand of Russia that she voluntarily relinquish her East European sphere of influence and thereby weaken her status as a world power. For Bernstein, the, quote, right of savages, end quote, to their land is, quote, conditional upon the, quote, higher right of a, quote, higher civilization, end quote. Whoever has followed the authoritarian apologia for Stalinist imperialism knows that it is largely based upon almost identical reasoning. Instead of the lower order of savagery, there is the lower order of capitalism whose national entities cannot be given priority over the higher right of superior, quote, a superior, quote, socialist economy, end quote, brought by Russia to all of Eastern Europe and the Baltic, lands at the point of Russian bayonets, 
The Polish bourgeoisie may have had a formal legal title to Poland, but it is Russia which Deutscher implies had the historical legal title. At least the gentle Bernstein was concerned with the method of German expansionism. Quote, not the weather, but the how, end quote, of colonialism is the, quote, decisive point, end quote. And his inexcusable defense of German imperialism was a defense of a culturally superior country's exploitation of lower, sometimes savage societies. The modern authoritarian revisionist, on the other hand, does not find the methods of Stalinist expansion the, quote, decisive point, end quote. And no one can refer to the pre-war Poland and Czechoslovakia as primitive societies. On the contrary, Poland has ha had, excuse me, Poland had a great, excuse me, had as great a cultural heritage as its Russian, quote, liberators, and Czechoslovakia a more advanced technology. The analogy between Bernstein and Deutscher, between revisionist and modern, quote, authoritarian socialism, end quote, does not hold at every point. There are differences as well as similarities, and the differences are illustra illustrative, in their own way, of the intellectual and moral debilitation of the socialist movement today. One dissimilarity is a matter of deception. The earlier revisionists presented them, their views as a criticism of Marxism. The authoritarian, revision, authoritarian revisionists feel compelled to pass off their apologias as the last word in Marxist thought. The paramount difference can be found in a conflicting evaluation of democracy. To the extent that the socialist movement accepted the revisionist reliance on the economic dynamism of modern capitalism circa 1900, its revolutionary militancy was subverted and its capitulation to reaction potential. But the early revisionists did not look upon political democracy as a luxury, expendable for a few decades or so. On the contrary, the primary practical concern of the revisionists was social reform and political democracy at home. These, in fact, were the fetishes of revisionism which induced Bernstein to shock the capitalist movement with his famous de cryptic declaration that for him the movement and the present means everything and the socialist future nothing. The modern authoritarian socialists, on the other hand, have adapted the revisionist concept of a progressive, self-evolving economic system but they have muted the revisionist immediate concern with democracy. The emasculated revisionism is then drawn to a consistent and pernicious conclusion and placed to the intellectual advantage of a politically uncivilized, uncivilized totalitarian regime. Bernstein's dictum is, in effect, transposed by the authoritarian revisionists to read, the present is nothing and everything must be subordinated to Russia's predestined socialist end. Deutscher endows communist ideology with the power to propel autocratic socialism onto democratic paths. Presumably the distorted socialist trappings adorning communist ideology and the circulation of selected, sometimes censored socialist classics serve to, to affect a democratic transformation as industry continues to expand and undercut the economic rationale for totalitarian practices. However, the socialist texts and slogans are only a light traveling case in the party's intellectual baggage. While the Kremlin is obliged to incorporate much of the Marxist idiom in its propaganda, its major ideological thrust is and must be designed to tear the heart out of socialism in order to justify morally and politically the continuation of one-party rule with its concomitant suppression of democracy, denial of civil liberties, etc. Nevertheless, there is some truth in Deutscher's claim, for reasons which we need not elaborate here. The Kremlin is obliged to bring millions into contact with socialist ideas. This is one of the internal dilemmas or contradictions of communism. Since reading Marx and Lenin undoubtedly serves to heighten awareness of the contradiction between communist reality and socialist theory. This nourishes democratic oppositional moods from below, which is an altogether different proposition from Deutscher's vision of an ideologically fed, self-reforming ruling party. There is reason to believe that those who are inflicted by the socialist aspects of communist ideology will be driven into more active forms of opposition to the Kremlin hierarchs. Reform and Reality <clears throat> 
reform in reality. Yet there is reform in Russia, and here the authoritarian, quote, socialist, end quote, believes he has his trump as he plays the relaxation of terror and improved living standards to prove that his theories and predictions are in harmony with reality. Reform is a fact in post-Stalin Russia, and a welcome one. But to welcome reforms is not necessarily to welcome the society within which they are achieved. The Kremlin's political relaxation does not imply a relaxation of socialist opposition to the continuing totalitarian system in Russia. The reforms we are welcome... The reforms are welcome for their own sake and for the additional specific reason that they are in part a response to pressure from below. In this we find confirmation of a fundamental humanist assumption that man is moved by an elemental instinct to gain and enjoy freedom, and a further repudiation of the melancholy view that totalitarianism reduces man to an isolated atom, incapable of expression, pliant, terrified, demoralized, inept, adaptable. This theory received its most heavy-handed elaboration in the writings of Hannah Arendt. But it also is also explicit and implicit in Deutscher's elitism that Rus the Russian people lost the ability to think and act as a result of Stalinist terror and therefore had to rely on dispensation from a self-reforming ruling circle. We also welcome the reforms because we have learned from history that they do not always pacify a dissatisfied population, but rather encourage people to demand more and act in their own behalf. In Russia, we have reason to hope that this process will assume revolutionary proportions as the spiraling demands for reform rise above the theoretically permissive limits of a totalitarian society, drawn to the point where institutionalized democratic forms begin. Also encouraging are those changes which are not strictly reforms in the sense of a direct and immediate alleviation of the hardships of life for the majority of people under totalitarianism. We have in mind above all the so-called economic reforms inspired by Yevsi Liberman, designed to streamline the nationalized economy through providing greater local autonomy for economic managers. money incentives and bonuses to managers and workers based on plant profit instead of production, and permitting prices to shift in response to changes in the market. The Liberman plan has nothing to do with the reintroduction of capitalism, as some writers think. Raising totalitarianism's economic efficiency does not inspire many hosannas in this corner. What the fuck that word means. An expression of adoration or praise or joy. I've never heard that. Raising totalitarianism's economic efficiency does not inspire any hosannas in this corner, even if some basic benefits eventually filter down to the producers. But the struggle of economic administrators to overcome party resistance to the Liberman proposals reflects a growing cleavage in Russian society between the men of the party apparatus and the technicians and economic managers who are more concerned with efficiency and their own authority than with ideology and party controls, although the division is not always clear and political and economic authority overlaps. Since one party control is the natural state of affairs in a totalitarian society, any move by any other segment of that society, be it in the economic be it the if the economic managers, the scientists, the military, the governmental administrators to encroach upon the supremacy of the party in a particular sphere places enormous stress on the monolithic character of the system. In this sense, the new authority which the economic managers have gained with the Liberman proposals tends to loosen important strands in the totalitarian fabric, and this we welcome more, most heartily.
not because we think that economic managers are liberal or progressive, but because it tends to encourage resistance from below to the overall repressive policies of both the party leaders and the economic managers on top. Also, as competition of various bureaucracies with each other and with the ruling party intensifies, each may feel obliged to seek wider support in lower social and political echelons, thereby further weakening the system as lines are drawn more firmly and larger numbers become more directly involved in the struggles. For all the challenges and reforms in Russia, the system remains totalitarian. The party is still firmly in control and not a single democratic institution is even on the horizon. Only the Communist Party has permitted a legal existence. The law, despite additional reforms in the past year, remains in the, in the sum of its theory and practice the most reactionary of any advanced Western nation. The, quote, trade unions, end quote, despite a greater degree of autonomy, have not lost their essential Stalinist function of supervising and disciplining the working class in the interest of party control and greater productivity. Strikes are forbidden, and the few recent spontaneous strikes we know of have been brutally suppressed. The manifestations of anti-Semitism have abated somewhat, but are far from eliminated. Culturally, party policy after Khrushchev still belongs to the Dark Ages, despite concessions forced out of the regime by a restive and emboldened younger generation. Russia remains a society where the people have less freedom and less to eat than in any industrialized capitalist nation. If it should be accepted in the left-wing world that such a nation can be defined as socialist in the spirit of Deuterism, then socialism will have been crowned with thorns of reaction and its humanist and democratic soul crucified on the cross of nationalization and ideology. November 1965 Okay, that's the end of the essay. I'm going to read the notes now. So if you don't want to listen to me read the notes, then uh, you can stop. I don't really know what the notes are connected to. This view of Malenkov and Khrushchev prepared to sacrifice communism in East Germany does not prevent the same Deutscher from writing the exact opposite elsewhere. Thus, in The Great Contest, when discussing Eastern Europe, he explicitly includes East Germany as a part of Eastern Europe. He wrote, quote, To be sure, Stalin's successors cannot and will not preside over the liquidation of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, end quote. As we shall see, such blatant contradictions are an integral part of Deutscher's special style of apologetics for totalitarianism. Note 2 says nothing. 3. Deutscher did not footnote his source. It had to be uncovered. Nam Josny's article appeared in the October 1951 issue of the Journal of Political Economy, republished by the University of Chicago Press. Deutscher does not mention that in the August 1952 issue of the same journal, there is a critical review of Jasny's essay by A. David Redding, which in this writer's opinion was as effective as Jasny's subsequent rejoinder was unconvincing. 4. In David Dallin's The Real Soviet Russia, Yale University, 1944, and his forced labor in Soviet Russia, co-authored with Boris Nikolevsky, Yale University Press, 1948, the number of camp inmates is placed within the 7 to 12 million range on the basis of exhaustive research and painstaking analysis. 5. Malenkov also addressed the 20th Congress. His speech, we can be sure, was not given a stormy ovation since he was already in disgrace in his confession and preparation. But according to Deutscher, in the same article quoted above, quote, it was Malenkov's heyday that it was in Malenkov's heyday that the Stalin cult was in fact undermined, end quote. If this is the case, what is to stop one from reading Deutscher's applausograph as follows? The delegates to the 20th Congress applauded Khrushchev, the man who wanted to compromise the fight against Stalinism, as much as it applauded Mikoyan, practically a Trotskyist in his assault on Stalinism, and barely acknowledged the existence of Malenkov, in whose heyday the Stalin cult was undermined because they wanted to call a halt to de-Stalinization.
Six. In the New Statesman, April 17, 1964, Dorcher draws a more accurate portrait of Khrushchev that reads like a point-by-point -point refutation of his earlier glorified sketch. 7. Apart from the obvious contradiction in these two versions, there is a deeper, more fundamental methodological contradiction. Deutscher believes that because of Russia's backwardness and isolationism, political repressions were inevitably there. Now China today is more backward economically and culturally than Russia of the late 20s and 30s, and was even more primitive seven years ago. How was it possible then for our, excuse me, how was it possible then for Deutscher to find a free democratic socialist welfare state emerging in China in 1957 when, by his own reasoning, the, quote, affinities between Maoism and power and Stalinism, end quote, should have been even closer than today? If there is a, quote, contradiction, end quote, as he calls it, between democratic socialist strivings and, quote, China's primitive pre-industrial structure of society, end quote, in 1964, how could that contradiction have been overcome seven years earlier? 8. There may be no logical contradiction between these two versions, since it is theoretically possible that a Russian general riding over Europe in blood and glory would also try to institute reforms at home. But it is only theoretically possible. Any such adventure, as Deutscher must understand, would bring on a full-scale atomic war. To think that in a total atomic war, a Russian Bonapartist regime either could or would want to ameliorate the harshness of Russian life is to lose contact with the realities of this world. The more obvious contradiction is in version C, where Marshal Zhukov, the chief, quote, Bonapartist, end quote, contender who would ride in blood and glory, in version A, turns out to be a bit of a pacifist who resented Khrushchev's adoption of Molotov's hard and militaristic foreign policy. 9. There is a note of special peak in Deutscher's references to Max Schachtman. One reason may be that Schachtman is the individual most responsible in this country for developing the theory of bureaucratic collectivism. Another explanation may be found in the fact that Schachtman is the author of a series of brilliant polemics directed against Deutscher and his theories. Needless to say, Deutscher never replied. 10. In this writer's view, the Bolshevik Revolution was by far the most inspiring and democratic social revolution in all history. Its scope had no precedent, its heroism and aspiration not matched until the Hungarian Revolution of October 1956. The revolution's relevance for socialists today is, or should be, in the evidence it afforded that even in backwards Russia, the majority of the politically conscious and oppressed could be persuaded, not coerced, even if only briefly, to accept the leadership of a sophisticated revolutionary socialist party which hid neither its program nor its aim. Never before did the majority of the class in whose interest a revolution was organized prove to be its major active supporters and soldiers. This is not to deny that neither excuse me, this is not to deny that either Lenin or Leninism or the Soviet regime in its first years are deserving of critical review. The mistakes were many from the standpoint of revolutionary democratic socialism, but that is the subject of another article. Thanks for listening.